great desert in the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whatever the case may be in the time zone in which you preside. Every single one of them covered by this program, Coast to Coast AM. Leading it for the weekend version, I'm Art Bell. How you doing? Great to be here. Great to be escorting you through the weekend. We're about to examine the world news very quickly. And, you know, isn't there a newspaper that has a slogan that goes all the news that's fit to print? Well, I, too, wonder about this bad news thing. I mean, it's nothing but bad news, of course. And uh, does that mean that, does that mean that, Good news, there is good news, but it's not fit to print. I've often wondered about that. Anyway, you be the judge as you listen. Vienna. A Ukrainian presidential candidate, Viktor Yushchenko, was poisoned with dioxin, according to Dr. Saturday, adding that the highly toxic chemical could have been put in the opposition leader's soup, producing severe disfigurement and partial paralysis of his face. It's awful. I've seen it. It's absolutely awful. Yushchenko was in satisfactory condition, was expected to be released from Vienna's uh, a Vienna private clinic Sunday or perhaps Monday, and he'll go right back on the campaign trail in the Ukraine. So the, the pictures are incredible, just incredible, what they did to this man. And he's not the only one suspected of uh, of being poisoned either, by the way. Uh, Yasser Arafat's nephew said that uh, on Saturday his uncle may have died a, quote, unnatural, unquote, death. A statement certain to renew speculation among Palestinians and the rest of the Arab world, maybe the rest of the world, that uh, su suggests that uh, perhaps Israelis, the Israelis did it. Of course, they deny it. Nasser El Kidwa, who is um, also Palestinian envoy to the UN, made the comments after he handed over a 558 page medical uh, dossier to Palestinian officials in Ramallah. No diagnosis or reason has been given for Arafat's death, uh, coming from the French. And uh, they, it is suggested. Perhaps that's why he went to the French, because they would refuse steadfastly to, refu uh, to ever report the cause of death. Insurgents pressed their attack on U.S. troops and Iraq security forces Saturday killed five uh, Iraqi police officers, wounded 14 American soldiers in what seems to be just a relentless effort to take these elections, the coming elections, off, you know, derail them. We'll see. President Bush will make air pollution uh, a top priority in Congress early next year, starting with an aggressive push to build support for his pollution-cutting plan, according to senior administration officials. Uh, at the same time, the administration will hold off no later than March on a rule to cut pollution from power plants and such. So they're beginning to notice, and well, they should, because the news that is not carried by the mainstream press is the news I'll have in a moment, and it suggests a very great deal indeed is going on. <laughs> By the way, um, uh, in a moment, uh, a few moments, actually next hour, we're going to have Dr. Uh, Brian Weiss on, and uh, he's going to be talking about, well, he's going to be talking about the next life, uh, what happens after we after we die, and Stuart in Toronto, Canada, Fast Blast Me, you can do that, by, by the way, up on the website, uh, go to Fast Blast and fire me a question. Art, I'd be really grateful if you could answer this. Afterlife. From what you've heard regarding past life experiences and people like last week's guest scientists weighing the facts, do you believe in the existence of afterlife or not? Thanks, Stuart. Well, huh. hard question, Stuart. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I lean, I think I lean 
Yeah, I, I think I lean toward believing uh, there is indeed an afterlife for a lot of reasons, most having to do with all the interviews I've done with very rock-solid people, like tonight's guest, I might add. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to figure it, the whole question out yourself, you might want to listen tonight, because that's exactly what we're going to talk about. He's, uh, this is a, um, a very renowned scientist who has, has sort of stumbled into this himself. Dr. Brian Weiss um, was doing uh, some hypnotherapy, I believe, and ran in to past lives. I mean, just boom. I mean, you're in the, in the course of research trying to help a patient, and you run into something like this, and what do you do? Do you ignore it? Or do you begin to explore it, as any scientist should, and figure out what in the heck is going on? Uh, that's what he did, and the uh, results of his research are pretty astounding. So stay tuned, as the saying goes. Now, the rest of the news. Also, not particularly good, mysterious tremors beneath the San Andreas Fault near the quake-prone town of Parkfield, and oh, it is, are shaking the Earth's brittle crust far below the region where earthquakes normally would strike. This is very deep stuff, folks, and scientists say they cannot understand what's happening or what the motions might mean. Seismic researchers are monitoring these strange vibrations closely, but whether the faint underground tremor is termed chatter, interesting term by some seismologists, portend an increased likelihood of a big quake in the area remain unresolved. A puzzle. Robert Nandu, the geophysicist at the U.S. Berkeley Seismological Laboratory, has charted more than 110 of these weird faint vibrations since they were first detected by the lab's high-resolution seismic network in Parkfield three years ago. What concerns him and his colleagues is that the epicenter of the great 1857 Fort Tejon earthquake, whose magnitude has been estimated at 7.8 to 8, was located almost exactly where they are now detecting these deep tremors. So you make up your own mind, but the earth seems to be uh, like a rattlesnake, which rattles its tail uh, just prior to demonstrating its displeasure with your presence does, I don't know, you decide for yourself. The media in this country is strange. A story as big as the world's changing climate, and somehow, by and large, they've managed to ignore it. The following from unknowncountry.com, Whitley Strieber's webpage. Despite the fact that the brutal number uh, involving the temperatures, summer heat of 2003, brought with it the highest weather-related death toll in European history. You would think that would be worthy, wouldn't, wouldn't you? The highest weather-related death toll in European history. Did you know that? The catastrophe was largely ignored by the U.S. media. Estimates of dead range from 22 to 35,000, and now a scientific group is warning that such summers could become the norm, and not just in Europe. Until now, it's been impossible to tell the degree to which heat generated by human activity might be responsible as opposed to natural weather processes. However, Peter Scott of the UK Meteorological Office, Hardly Center, uh, and Bastone and Miles Allen of Oxford University have been able, using extremely detailed data from thousands of different temperature sensors located all across Europe to determine this, and their findings are sobering indeed. After building a detailed computer model of the way the weather pattern built until it was recorded as the hottest summer in 500 years, and possibly the hottest summer in recorded history in Europe, the researchers found that most, if not all, of the extra heat came from human activity. Now... It's pretty severe when the weather in Europe is the hottest in 500 years. This probably means something. Uh, here's another interesting headline. Same source. Bizarre weather slams Japan yet again. 
17 typhoons in one season, followed by earthquake after earthquake, has caused frightened Japanese to drive up the price of gold because they're buying it against hard times ahead. Now, more extreme weather has struck the island nation, bringing gale force winds, a sudden extreme temperature increase that's unprecedented in the climatic history of that country. At 11.29 a.m. yesterday, listen to this, folks, the temperature in Tokyo rose 77 degrees Fahrenheit from 38 degrees in just a few minutes, breaking a record for sudden temperature rise in the city Set back in 1923. Now, this was accompanied by 90 mile per hour gales in central Tokyo earlier in the morning, marking the highest wind speeds they have ever recorded there. Twelve people were injured, air and rail transport paralyzed, drivers urged to stay off roadways, and there were widespread power outages. Citizens in northern areas were warned to expect extreme weather, as the unseasonably powerful warm front causing the havoc continued to race northeast. Now, whether you believe that uh, man's hand is involved in all of this, or you just believe it's a natural cyclical change that we're experiencing, I think you would agree with me, wouldn't you? And you might want to pipe up on this, that the, the Earth's weather is it's changing radically and quickly. Now, you don't have to agree that it's because of greenhouse gases. I personally don't think it matters what you believe. Uh, but if you agree that it is changing, then shouldn't we begin doing something about it now? I mean, perhaps fairly extreme measures beginning to shift the agricultural centers, planning for what's going to happen. I wonder if our government at its very highest levels is beginning to get reports suggesting that all of this indeed may be underway and what our government in secret, because that's how they do their work, is preparing for it. I don't know. I just know I read these reports and it seems conclusive to me. Now, sure enough... Uh, Brokaw, and well, Brokaw's gone, uh, but uh, all of the network, uh, uh, you know, speaking heads are just not talking about this stuff. Doesn't mean it's not happening, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be considering it, but the mass media, for some reason, is under reporting or not reporting what's going on around us. Pretty serious, I would say. All right, we are about to do open lines. And that means anything you want to talk about, it's okay. Any subject you would like to bring up is inbounds. So if you've got something you would like to uh, uh, get on the air and uh, share with the rest of the audience, now would be the time, and you know the numbers. They are ever so slightly different on the weekends. Uh, we'll have an announcement here at the bottom of the hour. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, this is Marcus from Kansas City. Yo, Marcus. Hey, I am so blessed to get through to you, Art. Uh, well, I, blessed I, to I have just, you. I just have it tonight, I guess. Hey, I'd like to, can I say a quick story? It's the star today. It's about 30 words long. You want me to read it or just uh, brief it? The star? It's a story, it's a story, a weird news story about a phys physicist in yeah. Texas. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, in November, the Fe Federation of American Scientists revealed the existence of a recent U.S. Air Force paid study of psychic teleportation prepared by true believing Nevada physicist Eric Davis, who wrote that moving oneself from location to location to mind power is quite real and can be controlled, unquote. Um, well, that was it. And I thought that was uh, really interesting that uh, this, this real scientist, I wonder I would if say you've heard of this guy. Extremely interesting. I heard, no, but, but I've heard of the story. Thank you very much. Um, psychic teleportation. Now, they're not talking about remote viewing. They're not talking about leaving the body, you know, as it were. I mean, uh, some sort of out-of-body experience. They're talking about actual physical uh, teleportation achieved through the power of the mind. And that is a fairly radical statement, I would say, for any scientist to make, and absolutely fascinating, and one has to wonder. Certainly would save a lot on airfare and such, wouldn't it? 
and that hassle you have to go through when you fly. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Hello. You know, I remember you saying some time back that uh, George Norrie was thinking about not screening his phone calls. And I've noticed such a big difference between your open lines and his so-called open lines. Well, I, I don't remember saying anything about that. George may have actually said something about it at some point or another, and I think he's gone through a couple cycles where uh, he didn't screen. Um, at any rate, as you can well, well, well testify, you know what, you, because you just got on the air and... You weren't screened, were you? Well, I know, but that's with you. And you always have great open lines. I mean, I used to look forward back in the early 90s to your show when you do open lines almost every night. I mean, it was... Well, to be fair here, look, I have never screened calls. Um, it's just... Well, but that was it's, the strength of your show. Well, and, uh, you and know, really, it, it, really to some degree, I... I needed it when George started screening them. Um, well... Uh, what can I say? I, I'm probably look. I'm probably the only person in radio that doesn't screen calls. <laughs> so don't you think you should talk, talk George into maybe? No, George, that's lead? it's absolutely. You know that one's up to George. What George, <laughs> what George does is what George does. The show has oh, been turned over to him during the week, and uh, and that's just the way it is. Uh, so. If George wishes to do as the rest of the country does and screen, that's you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it has always just been my habit to... I do things a little differently. I'm out here in the middle of nowhere, and so I run everything. You know, I run the commercials, I run the bumper music, I run uh, virtually everything, and um, I've never screened my calls just as a matter of habit. Uh, so there you are. But uh, what George does is is uh, thoroughly up to George. And uh, to be honest, what I do is the absolute exception to what most every other talk show host uh, around the world does. I mean, it is the norm to have them screened. I have just always felt, eh, what the hell, just go to what's next. Uh, first time caller line, in this case, you are next. Hello. Hi, this is Rob from Chattanooga. Hello, Rob. Uh, I have listened to your show quite a bit. Uh, this is actually the first time I'm calling. Yes, sir. Uh, we are... Um, I, I'm going to share some information that I, I received through my father roundabout. All right. Uh, but he worked for um, uh, an aerospace company and is now retired, but uh, did actually talk quite a bit about some of the secret things that is going that are going on. And, okay, um, like what? Well, uh, some of the some of the aerospace things out there that often are reported as UFOs that it's kind of interesting sometimes to hear about. For, exa uh, for example? Um, <laughs> an aircraft that can, uh, that is triangular in shape, virtually silent, uh, that can hover uh, and hit above Mach 1, in nearly instantaneous motion, um, things like that. Uh, uh, yes, I've seen one of those, thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> Quite a few people have. And it's pretty uh, interesting to hear some of the sightings of them. Well, yes, uh, indeed, many, many people have. But there is no record that I'm aware of of anything that's even a black project that, you know, has sort of made the circulation of, hey, this is real out there, kind of like the F-117 before it, you know, before we got to see it for real. Well, it, it was in service five years before they said it was. Uh, hmm. So that's, you know, uh, you, you're probably not hearing about that today because they did their mock test flight. Well, maybe you can tell me a little about it then. Um, well, what, what's, uh, wait a minute. What system of propulsion does this thing use? Uh, it's, it's a completely new type of system, and it's rumored that it came from uh, potentially Area 51, Hmm. Um, something of that nature, um, but it's uh, okay. So you don't have spe specific. I, I don't have specifics. I've oh. I've heard enough about it and and heard enough and, and and been told what to be able to look for in some of these um, uh, when you get UFO sightings and things like that to find out that it's it's technology that has been worked on now for uh, roughly ten years. Uh, 
that people are coming out with uh, UFO sightings on. Well, uh, that, would, that would make sense. Um, listen, but uh, if you also in the weather, though. The weather. Yes, uh, you you speak of the strangeness of the weather. Yes. And I think what we have done is we have all but opened Pandora's box. Uh, tale of a um, of a a weather system, uh, something that's located here in central United States, uh, that they do to help morph the wave currents of weather to push storms off of the East Coast. All right, sir. Thank. You. Code 775-727-1295. The first time caller line is area code 775-727-1222. To talk with Art Bell from east of the Rockies, call toll free at 800-825-5033. From west of the Rockies, call 800-618-8255. International callers may reach Art by calling your in-country Sprint Access number, pressing option 5 and dialing toll-free 800-893-0903. From coast to coast and worldwide on the Internet, this is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. It sure is. Good uh, day to you, everybody, whatever time of day it is. John in Post Falls, Idaho, blasts away at me. Come on, Art. We're getting tired of all this global warming crap. The Earth is cycling, and we can't do anything about it. You're just pushing your book in your fictional movie. Well, <laughs> no. Um, I, I wrote that book along with Whitley because it's what I believe is happening. The movie was just sort of a side benefit of that. And all that pushing stopped a long time ago. What I'm doing now is reporting. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm reporting the conditions uh, in the place where you, John, live. And uh, if you find that uninteresting or boring, then I would be very interested to see what does excite you. Folks. Tomorrow night, by the way, Whitley Strieber and Dr. Roger Lear. And they're going to be on in the first hour talking about a piece that's been investigated, ostensibly a piece from the Roswell crash, and what's happened, um, some pretty amazing things with that investigation. And then James McCanney. So it's going to be all, all things told, a very, very interesting weekend. First time caller line, you are on the air. Hello. Yes, uh, it's uh, Thomas from Michigan. Yes, sir. And uh, we're talking about uh, global warming. And I noticed uh, I was on uh, Robert Hoagland's uh, website. Uh, I, Richard Hoagland. Uh, Richard, okay, sorry. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, Enterprise something or other. It should dot be. com. Enter Enterprisemission.com, yes. Okay. Um, he, uh, it, in there, uh, he has a hyperdimensional thing about hurricanes. Uh -huh. Several pages into that, 
he has uh, evidence that every planet in the solar system is heating up. Oh, yes. Uh, that would be... Look, there are, there are two ways to look at this, sir. Thank you. One is that uh, our sun has increased emissions. That would cause the heating of all the planets exposed to the sun. Another uh, entirely possible scenario is that each of these planets, for some reason, perhaps even a hyperdimensional reason, I don't know, are in fact heating up. But there's evidence that uh, things are melting away, what there is on Mars right now, and that they may all be heating up. So, yeah. Okay, that was, you know, I just wanted to mention it. All right, well, mention it, you did. Either way, it's going on. And I don't, you know, again, it doesn't matter what model you follow, a hyperdimensional one, uh, a sort of a man's hand one, or just a s cyclical one. What's the diff? The fact of the matter is, it's changing. And in order to adapt, and that is what we have to do, adapt, uh, you see, it's really positive stuff I'm talking about here. I'm talking about living, adapting uh, to what's going to happen, whether we like it or not. That means growing crops where they will grow. That means, if necessary, moving people where it might become uninhabitable to places where it might. Moving them from places that might be underwater to places above ground. That kind of thing. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hello. Art, an honor to speak to you once again. And to you. Uh, where are you, sir? This is Matt, the security guard in Tampa. Yes. Um, this is a story my niece told me. It sounds like a really bad sci-fi movie, but it's the truth. Uh, there was a couple that went to Mexico and picked up some souvenirs, brought them back home. One of these souvenirs was a cactus. So they're sitting at the house. One day they look at the cactus, and it starts to throb. The cactus begins to throb. Right. And they thought, this is rather abnormal behavior for a cactus, so they Absolutely. called a local nursery. Yes. The guy on the nursery, at the nursery totally freaked out, said, get out of the house now. And then he called 911. Fire <laughs> department shows up. These guys go in with level one chemical suits. What? Yeah. It's, oh, man. Okay. All right. And here's this, the, is this cactus, I mean... When you say throbbing, do you mean like getting like, bigger? Like it's and breathing. Like, oh, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, I guess. They put the cactus in a chemical barrel, put the lid on it, yes. take it out of town. Uh -huh. The thing explodes with millions and millions of little bitty tarantulas. Tarantulas? Yes. Apparently, uh, mommy tarantula goes in and makes a nest in the uh, cactus. And has all little baby tarantulas, and then when oh they start... Oh, my God. Can you imagine if that had gone off anywhere near anybody? They were to ruin their whole weekend. Exploding tarantula-filled cactuses. That's a new yes. one, sir. Thanks, Art. Uh, you're very welcome. That's absolutely a new one. Can you imagine looking over at the corner of your room or just outside your house where you had carefully pra uh, you know, planted some big cactus, and it began throbbing... And, well, I guess now, having heard this, you would obviously know what's coming next. What a nightmare. Oh, ho, ho, ho. east of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Um, Hi. I was going to, going to call you last hour on this, and you turned, turned right into the topic I was going to mention. It's really strange. Um, I, when I used to live in Alaska, we had things happen there, and because Alaska's an immediate black hole, never got reported, and we had um, a serial killer and who did things in a strange way with an aircraft has never never happened in the U.S. before and maybe anywhere. Right. Never got reported. We had a volcano erupt, ash fall in Anchorage, never got reported. There, now, there was a big hurricane in Florida at the time, so that's kind of understandable. Florida, a lot more population. But, um, you know, our media is telling us that we've only warmed up by one degree in 100 years. Don't worry. Some places in Alaska have warmed nine degrees in the last 35 years. It's not reported except CBS News. And so, um, and I always lived in the, last day I lived in Colorado, um, uh, in Denver, and I've even owned a gun or fired a gun in her life, and they know it. She just happened to be in a car with the man who had killed a cop, and the guy killed himself, so they had to target her as the scapegoat. And everybody knows it. She can't get a pardon. No publicity in that nation, nationally. If that had happened in L.A., 
it would be a big cause, all the celebrities. Would well, be. actually, are you aware, uh, let's go back, to, to all the, of all the trees that are dying in, yes. in parts of Alaska and uh, so, some of the strangest things going on. I know I lived in Alaska in Anchorage for three years. Yes. And um, it's not just Alaska, sir. It's the rest of the world. Um, Art, I have a conclusion to this, and I wanted to, to ask your opinion of this, just to ponder it. I've often thought since 9-11... If 9/11 had not occurred in such a photogenic way, in such a horrible photogenic way, in such a you know something we thought could not happen with buildings falling, if it not had occurred in the media center of New York, if it had occurred in Alaska or North Dakota or somewhere, but if an equal number of people had died in a less visual fashion in a non-media place, what would have been the reaction? And I often I don't know I don't know the answer to that, and I would like your your view on that. Well. All right. Um, things occur in the third world, for example. Forget Europe and industrial Asia. Things occur in the poorer parts of the third world where the number of deaths are just mind-boggling. In fact, and, and they are occasionally reported in the Western press, but almost as an addendum to the day's news. And so it's the way the media works, I guess. People are interested in what's most immediately around them and so much less interested in what's uh, eight or nine or ten thousand miles away so maybe it's just a function of pretty much i don't care you know or the uh, newspapers radio uh, stations television people's eyes glaze over when they hear about these things and they just it doesn't mean anything to them because it's not close to them that's the only thing I, and only reason that I can think of that, you know, all of these things get ignored by the world's press, the U.S. press. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, good day to you. Uh, just wanted to see what you thought about the suspension of disbelief or denial, which seems to be capturing so much of the media when it, you look at the um, details about 9-11, all the, uh, how can <laughs> I say, disconnect and all the bizarre behavior of the administration and, you know, all the Carlisle Group contracts and stuff. It just seems like there's enough information to call it uh, a false flag recruiting project with Al-Qaeda being the patsies and somebody else bigger and more evil, in a sense, just trying to uh, put put our globe into a, how can I say, a, a, a jihad, which is forced upon us by uh, the same kind of people that, uh, you know, killed presidents and uh, people like John Lennon and Martin Luther King. I think... There's a lot of evidence out there that a lot of media just won't touch, and I just think the Constitution warrants more care and attention to the problem. Well, I, all right, I, I agree with you that there are a lot of things the media won't touch, no question about that. I, I probably disagree with you on the connection between, for example, who killed John Lennon and Martin Luther King and other world events. Those are not all connected. Um, not my mind, anyway. There are an awful lot of people who leap beyond... I, I mean, the truth is bizarre enough. What's going on in the world right now is bizarre enough without having to imagine uh, more complicated, less likely scenarios. I mean, stick with Occam's razor. What seems most likely is probably most likely. That's a, you know, prostitution of... of of Occam's razor, but it's 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 the general idea. The most likely thing is well, the most likely thing. International line, you're on the air. Hello, Art. My name is Dave. I'm on Salt Spring Island, uh, British Columbia, BC. All right, welcome to the program. Thanks. Uh, going about uh, a little scenario. Ed Dames was talking about the uh, crop circle somehow correlating with safe zones uh, for after the calamity of the, his kill shot. Uh huh. And uh, it comes to uh, my idea of what crop circles are, sort of like the way magnetic tape works, a magnetic burst punches a pattern. And I was thinking with crop circles, it's almost like something that would want to send a message interdimensionally, could send an energy burst into a pre-designated area, like a field, where the plants are lined up in a certain way, uh, a real positive impression could be made. And then the orbs seen flying over them are like the playback head. Anyway, if Earth is slated for destruction and these things are sending messages through time or some sort of dimension, they would want to ensure that the spots being 
used to pick up the message would survive. So they would predetermine places that would be spared to use. So you that. you you buy that as uh, crop circles being self safe zones. Well, he was trying to figure out why there was that correlation. He kind of moved uh, at one time. I think Ed had said that crop circles uh, were markers for time travelers and and so then he sort of moved over to this other idea and it may well be so who knows nobody knows what crop circles are they along with the animal mutilations appear to be truly unsolved you know just totally intractable problems scientifically uh, there's never been anybody that I'm aware of arrested for any or footprints found around any of these really truly bizarre mutilations where sharp instruments even laser cutting is indicated of um, some pretty weird areas on the animals and uh, nobody's ever been busted for it as I'm pretty positive of that in fact um, wildcard line you're on the air hi uh, hi Art yes this is David from Dover New Jersey David welcome welcome uh, yes thank you um, my uh, my topic tonight has to do with a topic that might tie in with your show tonight your, your guest later sure um, I'm not sure if some of the listeners know, but there's evidence in the Bible for reincarnation. Now, I could give you chapter and verse, or I could give you a summary. No, it's it's unnecessary. I, I'm aware that it was in the Bible uh, until they took it out, essentially. There, there's also some in the current Bible, the Protestant Bible. I'm sure some uh, made it through, but any obvious evidence was erased at, what, well, the Council of Nicaea, was that it? True, I believe 365 A.D.? Yes. Uh, I've been a Christian for a long time, but I've also found some interesting anomalies in the Bible that, that many Christians should actually check out before they, uh, you know, just disavow or or, or disregard uh, reincarnation altogether. Well, I don't. I certainly don't uh, disregard it. Uh, in fact, um, I think you'll find tonight's show, as you pointed out, is going to be evidence of that. And if you're like me, I, you know, what do I know about the afterlife? I only know, believe it or not, um, it, it's been the church being on the air. <laughs> I've interviewed uh, a lot of reputable scientists and investigators who have done very careful work, like tonight's guest, and have come to the conclusion that uh, you bet there's an afterlife. In fact, life after life after life after life and you'll get some idea of the real science behind it all uh, tonight if you stick with us. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art. This is Todd. I'm listening to you in Motley, Minnesota tonight. It's a whopping 31 degrees here today. Uh-huh. Um, in the past, you had talked about a gentleman who had, uh, had apparently water in his fuel tank. He put some pills in it and drove away. Well, I was talking to my dad a few weeks ago. And they used to make acetylene gas by putting crystals in water way back in the 40s and the 50s. Well, that got me to thinking that acetylene is a lot like uh, methane gas. What if he was doing something like that? I, sp I suppose it's certainly possible. You know, instead of being a big secret and all that, it probably was very some something very simple. Mm-hmm. Alchemy of some sort. I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, there may have been all sorts of science that was once known by m some of mankind that has been forgotten or simply uh, died with those who understood how to do it. You never know. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hello? 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 Is this Art? That would be me. Art, this is Bruce in Tempe, Arizona. Bruce, you're going to have to yell at me. You're not very strong. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Is that better? Uh, yeah, get good and close to the phone and yell at me. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you know anything about the Geminid meteor shower tomorrow night? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, other than I guess I've heard it may not be as spectacular as previous years. What have you heard? Well, I saw it last year, and it was... I, I love to watch the meteor shower, so I try to watch every one. Yes. And I saw it last year, and there were meteors coming from all over the sky. They weren't just from one particular area. And it was like the best meteor shower I saw all year. Well, uh, that's amazing. Uh, you know, most of the, the meteor showers, with the exception of one over the last several years, 
have been kind of a disappointment to me. I mean, I've got very clear skies here in the desert near Death Valley, very clear skies, very low humidity as a general rule, and you can go out during a meteor show and see the best of it. Well, I've got to tell you, every time I've gone out lately, I've been kind of disappointed. Um, there, there have not been anywhere near... In fact, it seems just like a normal night of a few scattered meteors here and there. Nothing to write home about at all. West of the Rockies, you're on the air without a lot of time left. Hello. Mr. Art? Yes. Um, Tammy, here in Spokane, we listen to you on AM 590. Hi, Tammy. Do you, can you give me the county or area uh, where Mel's Hole is? No, oh. uh, although in the in the Mel's Hole program, it was identified uh, quite specifically, and know, they even referred to the uh, satellite photograph. So you're going to have to refer to that. Okay. All right. Uh, why? You. Why are you going to go hunting for it? Oh, you betcha. You are, huh? Yeah, we're right nearby. And if oh, really? Yeah. Eastern Washington. Yeah, we're here in Spokane. Spokane, that's right. You're not far from it. Well, no. if you found Mel's Hole, what would you do? Well, I just observe for one thing. You mean like go up and look down inside? Well, if the maybe uh, maybe throw a rock down. Well, if the government people still aren't, you know, taking that over. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well. Well, Mr. Bell, you don't know if it was my, Rockford or. My advice is no, I don't. And my advice is if you find it, be very careful. I will. I always am. All right. Take care, Thank of you. Yeah. Good night. Coming up, we'll examine the possibility, the probability of an afterlife with a man who's studied the subject scientifically, Dr. Brian Weiss from the high desert. I'm Art Bell. Riders on the storm. Riders on the storm. Into the south into a patient's prior life or perhaps a time he spent in between lives. I mean, as a researcher, as a scientist, as a psychotherapist, you, you would have, or you should have, insatiable curiosity about such an event occurring. Uh, that's exactly the kind of person we're going to talk to tonight. Uh, as a traditional psychotherapist, Dr. Brian Weiss was astonished and skeptical when one of his patients began to recall past life traumas that seemed to hold the key to her recurring nightmares and anxiety attacks, ostensibly the reason for her being there, his skepticism was eroded, however, when she began to channel messages from the space between lives, which contained remarkable revolutions of revelations, rather, about Dr. Weiss's family and his own dead son. Using past life therapy, he was able to cure the patient and then embark on a new, more meaningful phase of his own career. Dr. Weiss is the author of several top-selling books based on his experience as a psychiatrist and healer. A graduate of Columbia University and Yale Medical School, Dr. Weiss is chairman emeritus of psychiatry at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami. And he maintains a private practice in Miami. In addition, Dr. Weiss conducts natural uh, national and international seminars and uh, experiential workshops as well as training programs for professionals in a moment, Dr. Weiss. Folks. Dr. Brian Weiss, welcome back to the program. It's only been about seven or eight years or so. Well, a little shorter than that, Art, but it's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. Um, anyway, great to have you back. And before we dive into the spectacular part of what we're going to talk about tonight, I have an observation that I'm sure many have made, and that is that in America, we have, anyway, I guess in the world, uh, certainly in America, we have a lot of mental illness and America doesn't have much of a system for handling mental illness. It seems like uh, yeah, there must be a better way. And in your profession, I'm sure that you've given this a lot of thought. The mental health system in the U.S. seems to be a disaster. Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Well, I agree with you. It's really done in a not in a compassionate way. And it's relied too much now on medication. Everything is turned towards that. As a matter of fact, many of the younger psychiatrists are very dissatisfied because a lot of them went into the field looking to talk with patients, to get to understand them, to help them, to, to relate at a deeper level. And now they're reduced to just handing out medications all the time without really getting to know them because they won't get reimbursed if they spend more than 10 or 15 minutes with the patient. So it really is in a state of disarray. It needs to change. It's not good for the doctors either. Um, uh, doctor, is there any way of um, of your knowing whether mental illness is a, becoming a larger problem in America in terms of the numbers afflicted, or is it stable at a certain percentage of the population? Any thoughts? Well, it, it really depends what illnesses we're speaking about. Probably schizophrenia is relatively stable, although I think some people have been overdiagnosed. But the incidence of stress-related diseases, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, post-traumatic stress disorder, these are going up because the world is getting to be so much more stressful and we've lost a lot of our support systems. So, so when you, you have to really break it down by illness. The numbers of bipolar people, for example. That seems to be going up, oh. I think, for a couple of reasons. One, it's better recognized now. It's diagnosed more often. It, before, people used to be just shuttled off to addicts. You know, the, the third, the, the top store, I don't mean drug addicts, but addicts in the house. I understand. It would be hidden there. Uh, people would be lost in, in asylums. And so what's happening now is diagnostic skills have gotten better for that. But on the other hand, um, the pharmaceutical companies are so powerful and they make uh, so many drugs for specific illnesses that these are probably getting overdiagnosed because the therapists think, well, now I have a treatment for it. How, effa how effective are they, these drugs? Some, some of them are. I mean, there's no question about it. For bipolar, we, there's, lithium has been around for a long time and some of the anticonvulsants are used now. But... To, to just use the medicine without the talking therapy, without the increase of understanding that can come through that, mm. I think is not good. It's got to be both in that case. I guess that's sort of an ongoing uh, almost war between traditional physicians and uh, uh, drug companies and uh, psychiatry in general, huh? It is. It's a very difficult situation for psychiatrists because they're kind of caught in the middle. And if they're intelligent, they'll, they, they usually get dissatisfied. They're not able to really relate and talk to their patients at a deeper level. The pharmaceutical companies are only interested in the drugs. Mm -hmm. And the government is interested in whatever's cheapest, which, which has nothing to do with necessarily the health of the patient. So there we are. Um, all right. Well, I, I can... I guess I can't imagine what it would be like to be trying to help out a patient, and I, I, for this I'd like to take you back to how this began for you, because I guess that's where an interview like this should begin. I, I mean, to me, it would be astounding to be treating somebody for, I don't know, some anxiety they have or whatever, and to bump into something completely unrecognizable in, in the middle of hypnotherapy or, or some such. Is that... I mean, how did it happen? Lay it out. It's kind of like you're saying, Art. I did not believe in past lives, and neither did the patient, who was a, um, a young woman in her late 20s, a Catholic woman. And yet, when we were doing regression through hypnosis to go back to her childhood to look for traumas that I felt might be causing her symptoms in the current time, she, under hypnosis, started to remember a lifetime about 4,000 years ago. Now, I didn't believe in this, and yet it was shocking because it was so vivid and so emotional and so detailed for her. She was seeing this visually, recalling herself in a different body, different name, drowning in a flood or tidal wave at the end of that life, somewhere in the Near East or the Eastern Mediterranean. Doctor, it, do, you, do you recall what tripped this? Uh, in other words, as you were cruising along uh, in, in whatever modality you'd be in at that time. I mean, something must have tripped this. Absolutely. What, what happened was that the first time that we did this, she remembered some childhood tra 
traumas, but her symptoms remained severe. So the next week when she was in, I asked her to go back to the time when her symptoms first began, thinking she'd go back younger in childhood. But that that statement, go back to the time when your symptoms first began, Oh, that was the trip. That Her subconscious mind taking that literally, Got you. that's when it went back 4,000 years because one of her symptoms was a fear of gagging or choking and also a fear of water. And that's what her mind chose to focus upon. So when she drowned in that ancient lifetime, that caused the fear of gagging or choking because it disappeared after she had the memory. And so that was the, the key. Huh. That is so correct. she just yeah she just she just followed the instruction, and and uh, since the uh, uh, the primary cause of her current problem wasn't in this lifetime, away she went. Exactly. Um. In how much? I mean, how strongly did you realize that that you had moved from something that happened in her life to something that had happened in another life? And how do you go about exploring that once you're there? Well, I remember this vividly, even though it was, for me, 24 years ago and more than 4,000 patients ago. But Catherine, the woman we're talking about, the woman from Many Lives, Many Masters, she was the first. So I remember being shocked, but also not believing it. I thought, this has got to be imagination or metaphor or fantasy. But why so vivid? Why so detailed? Why so much emotion, which we call catharsis, uh, reacting with such emotion with the memory. Right. And why was she getting better? Because imagination doesn't do this. So it, it kind of came upon me almost gradually. There was a part of me that didn't believe it, and another part of me that knew that it didn't fit. It, it, it just didn't fit with imagination. Well, as, as a matter of curiosity, uh, you said Catherine, the one we're talking about, is 4,000 patients ago. Yes. How often during a, a hypnotherapy session uh, do you run into something like this? I, I mean, there are many psychiatrists across America that uh, many of them do uh, hypnosis. You would think that this might even be common if all we're talking about is common. And so you would think many psychiatrists would run into this or bump into this. Do they? And, and, and why don't they notice more and more are, and I, oh. I do trainings now. I train 100 to 200 therapists from all over the world every year now. But, but actually hypnosis, which is only a form of focusing the concentration, it's very safe. And we get hypnotized every day when you're uh, watching a movie and you don't hear the person munching popcorn next to you because you're concentrating in the movie. Right. That's what hypnosis is. That's a light state. Or reading a good book and you don't hear traffic noises. That's hypnosis, so it's very safe. But most psychiatrists don't practice hypnosis. Most therapists haven't been. Hypnotherapists have been doing it more for smoking cessation or weight loss. Right. So they would just be reading a script. And they weren't asking these open-ended questions like, go back to the time when your symptoms first began, or let's go back into a past life, because it wasn't in their belief system. And so actually it was happening, but not as commonly as you might think. And then when it did happen, the psychiatrist or the psychotherapist, because many of these are not psychiatrists, would be afraid to talk about it because they didn't want to be considered weird or strange and were very concerned about the professional reaction. So they didn't tell anyone, and they certainly didn't write about it. Well, isn't that understandable? I yeah. mean, um, you've been at it for a while now and published on this. Uh, how's the reaction been? Well, it, it, it took me five years to write Many Lives, Many Masters because I was concerned about that. Here I was chairman of the psychiatry department. Yes. I was professor of psychiatry at the University of Miami. Yes. This was very risky. So then I wrote it. I kept getting pushed to write it in a sense. It was helping my patients with grief. They were finding out about death and what happens after death and the space in between lifetimes. And so... Immediately, there was a lot of support from individual therapists and doctors, also cardiologists and emergency room doctors and oncologists, those who were dealing with death and dying, had seen lots of these strange occurrences. But from the professional organizations like the American Psychiatric Association, there was a lot of negative feedback, and there was even a move to, to um, censure me. 
Oh. Possibly to bring me up before the licensing board. Oh. But that never got anywhere. It just kind of deteriorated into chaos because I had been training many of the psychiatrists in Miami and in psychopharmacology. That was one area of, of interest and work for me. Well, as you Here know, we, 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 as you, as you know uh, we've recently lost uh, Professor Mack. Yes. And what he went through sounds an awful lot like what you almost went through. It was kind of like what John went through a little bit. I did a workshop with him in Boston some years ago because when he was regressing people to their abduction experiences, they were often remembering their past lives. So he called me up <sighs> and said, um, Brian, I'm validating your work. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I would like you to do a conference with me up here in Boston. And so we did, and I was so sad to hear about his accident and his death. Yes. Um, so he did, though. He picked up the phone and, and told you that, uh, that he was validating your work uh, through, through exploration of um, abductions, alleged ab abductions, and, and bumping into past lives. Yes, many of his patients were recalling past lives when, while he was doing his research, while he was regressing them to their abduction experience. And then he got in touch with me, and we, we shared our data. And he was very confirming. He, he had a harder time than I did, I think, because I was able to, to go before boards and tell them, look, um, patients are getting better, whether you believe in it or not. Maybe you could consider this past life thing Jungian, metaphoric. <laughs> I don't, because I've seen so much. But if you want to consider it that way, that's fine with me. But patients are getting better. It's very safe. It's very effective. Maybe that's the reason it all went sliding by. I uh, think so. Be, because uh, it was effective no matter what you might think it was versus what they thought. Exactly. It really works. It's kind of like psychoanalysis. You go back with the patient. They're in a very relaxed state, except the arena is expanded. So instead of stopping at infancy or birth, we go back into in utero experiences and into past lives. And, of course, in addition to be, being healing, now there's so many validated cases that it was very hard for the psychiatric boards to refute the, the clinical improvement and also the validation mm -hmm. cases. Yes. So they just let it go to the side. A doctor, if you were to take 100 people off the street, uh, have permission to attempt to look for past lives, how many would you guess uh, would be successful? Well, when I do these big workshops, and um, not even one at a time, but all together, because hypnosis can, is, of course, can be done with the eyes closed and they're listening to my voice, about two-thirds will have a past life experience the first time. Oh. And if we did it more often, then it would get up to around 80%. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a whole lot. Exactly. Um, so, I, I guess, I guess if I were pursuing this and, and this, and what had ha happened to you had happened to me, I would begin looking for what all scientists would, and that would be proof, some sort of proof of the things that were being said, uh, some historical research or something that would prove what these people were saying was true. Of course, I look for that, too. And usually the patient is tracking it down, and there's some incredible validation cases. And, and yet there was the other um, avenue that I was also exploring, and that was the therapeutic benefits, the healing, the people getting rid of symptoms. Of course. So they were both going on at the same time. Well, I'm sure that would be your primary job. Um, uh, secondary, you know, in, in researching all of this and trying to prove it, uh, so that you could write about it, it'd be very helpful to run into proof. <laughs> oh, exactly. And and there's some cases, such as the case of Jenny Kakel, the British woman who found her past life children, because many of the people have are, uh, reincarnated. Now I'm going to talk as if I believe in it, because I do. After 25 years of doing this, I have seen so much that I really do. But I understand that listeners may not, Yet and and of course there's there's as you try it as you experience it you learn so much more but but Jenny along with several other people have found their children from past lives so many have found their graves or records of their lives that they're recalling under hypnosis um, many people have been able to speak foreign languages that they've never learned 
this huh. ability called xenoglossy. And I can tell you in more detail uh, some of these cases, but they're just amazing. Yes, um, I would be very interested in, in that. I, I mean, I, I struggle with the whole life after death thing. I think like everybody else, we had a caller in the first hour who mentioned uh, reincarnation and said, look, it was in or is in the Bible and uh, to a much greater degree used to be in the Bible but was kind of yanked out. Yes, I heard him. And I heard oh, the oh you did. And... Uh, wonderful. Um, all, all right, stay right there, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Brian Weiss is my guest. Thousands, tens of thousands of patients, perhaps. And many, many lives. In fact, that resonates with the title of the book, Same Soul, Many Bodies. That's one of the books. Uh, we'll explore all of that, and you can make your own decision as the night progresses with Dr. Brian Weiss. Wildcard line at area code 775 727 1295. The first time caller line is area code 775 727 1222. To talk with Art Bell from east of the Rockies, call toll free at 800 825 5033. From west of the Rockies, call 800 618 8255. International callers may reach Art by calling your in country Sprint Access number, pressing option 5, and dialing toll free. 800-893-0903. From coast to coast and worldwide on the Internet, this is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. It is, and Dr. Brian Weiss, definitely exploring areas that you will not hear explored in the rest of the media. You just don't hear it. So here would be the place where you come, and so many do. Dr. Brian Weiss is a graduate of Columbia University and Yale Medical School. Not a lightweight, folks. Dr. Weiss, Chairman Emeritus of Psychiatry at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami, maintains a private practice as well in Miami. He'll be right back. Don't move. I think I'm much like many of you in that I really want to believe in an afterlife. After all, I'll be 60 years old in, uh, in June, so I'm facing the prospect of my own mortality. So everybody doing that would want to believe in an afterlife. On the other hand, there is a pragmatic side of me that says, no, wait a minute, we don't really have any proof and yet Dr. Weiss a very learned man just before the break said he now believes in reincarnation and uh, that belief is a, that's a very strong thing to say 
Um, you've obviously been convinced by what's happened to you, and I would very much be interested in some specifics, Doctor, the things that convinced you. Maybe they'll convince me, too. Well, let me tell you two stories, then, two case histories. Um, one is a woman I saw from China, a surgeon trained in Western medicine. This was her first trip out of China. She oh. came with an interpreter to my office in Miami, and we did a past life regression. She couldn't even say hello in English, couldn't speak any English at all. That must have made, I would think, um, in the synergy between uh, doctor and patient, that would make it doubly tough. Well, it, it is a, um, an obstacle in a sense, but I found that doing regressions or doing this work with a translator works pretty well, too. They hear things twice, so hmm. it's more, it doesn't seem to get in the way of the regression. Okay. Just in, it takes a little longer because you're working through the translator, <clears throat> but we were doing it, and I've been all over the world doing this in different languages, Spanish and Italian and Portuguese, so uh, to do it in... In, and in Jap Japanese too. So here was Chinese, and this is an important woman in, in coming from Beijing, and uh, as I said, a surgeon. And she remembered a lifetime during this regression in the San Francisco area of the U.S. about 1850. And in that life, she was having an argument with her husband, and she began to speak during the session in very colorful, fluent English. Wow. And. and this is that xenoglossy thing, speaking foreign languages you've never learned. The translator didn't realize it at first because um, translators hear one language and they translate into the other. So he started translating the whole thing back into Chinese for me. And I had to hold up my hand and say, stop it, I understand the English. So yes. that kind of thing, because I knew, and he certainly knew, I thought he would fall out of his chair, the translator, that she couldn't speak English at all 30 minutes before this. And here she was speaking English fluently. So as a scientist, you have to say, what is this? How does this work? What is this all about? Another case is a woman that I started to mention before the break, Jenny Coquel, a British woman. I met her at first um, talk when she was 41 years old, and she was talking to her 85-year-old son and her 81-year-old daughter. And the story is from the time she was a little girl, and this is just like the, the past life cases of Ian Stevenson and others. She had known she had a family in Ireland, that she had eight children. She's telling this to her parents when she's three years old. That her husband was irresponsible and she couldn't trust him to, to watch over the children because she had died and left them when she was young. She had eight children. She died early. She needed to find her children. And she, she knew her name was Mary, but she didn't remember her last name. She drew some crude maps. She drew a church with an unusual facade. She drew a large white building with many windows. But not enough. The parents didn't believe in this. There wasn't enough data, really, to go on. Jenny grew up and got married, still with intrusive memories, dreams of this past life family in Ireland and her eight children. She got out her maps. Uh, now, she's an adult with two children of her own. She decided to do something about it. She compared her childhood maps with an atlas of Ireland, found a town, Malahide, northeast of Dublin, that looked like her maps, and decided to go there. So she's walking in the main street of the village, having deja vu feelings, and then she found, finds the church that she had drawn when she was a little girl, the church with the unusual facade. Oh. And she knew she was in the right place. But the house she felt she lived in was empty in ruins since the 1950s. She felt she lived there in the 20s and 30s. But now with the help of the townspeople, they find that the family that lived there was the Sutton family. The mother's name was Mary Sutton. She died from complications of childbirth after the birth of her eighth child. So all these facts are coming true. In the large white building that Jenny had drawn when she was a little girl, that was the hospital in Dublin, and Jenny was able to go there, go to the very room and describe what happened. And the husband was irresponsible. Of the eight children, they all grew up in orphanages, and five were still alive. So they open up the records. There's this big reunion. The youngest two didn't even know that they had siblings. They had grown up in different orphanages. God. And Jenny was able to tell them all about their childhoods, the little details that only their mother knew. And wow. when you come across cases like this, 
and you see it again and again. Yes. These are very convincing. They are very convincing. Um, how far down line, I mean, the early stuff, and then how far down line do you think you made the flip when you suddenly, I mean, the light bulb went on and you said, okay, this is real. Well, there were, there were a couple parts for me it, because I was so left brain, still am, you know, all that. I, I had written over 40 scientific chapters in, in, in jur scientific journals like Nature, Brain Research, Science. I had published a book before Many Lives, Many Masters. It was called The Biology of Cholinergic Function. You can't find it. So I, I was really left brain. And what happened to me was about the fourth or fifth time that Catherine was having one of these past lives. And I was still struggling with it, even though she was getting better. Even though at a deep level I knew this wasn't the usual stuff, something mm. really beyond the normal was going on here. She died in the Middle Ages lifetime, and she floated above her body, replicating the near-death right. experience work of Raymond Moody and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and others. And she had never heard of these people, she told me. So she tells me she finds this beautiful light that re-energizes re her, and she says to me, there are two people here to see you, your father and your son. Now, my, my training in psychotherapy was not to tell the patient anything about yourself. You want them to project that into the therapeutic arena. Certainly. So I don't even have diplomas. My diploma's hanging in my office. She knew nothing about me. And she was a laboratory technician in the hospital, not an FBI agent, not an investigative reporter. She tells me my father there is there and my son. She says, your father's name is Avram. And that's how she pronounced it, Avram. She's a Catholic woman from New England. She didn't say Abraham or mm -hmm. anything like that. She said, he died from his heart, and your daughter is named after him, and your son is here, and he's very tiny and shining brightly, and his heart is important also because it's turned around backwards. But now it's in the right place. And she went on to tell me many more details about my father and my son. My father had died of a heart attack uh, two years before her therapy began, so she was right about the heart. His Hebrew name was Avram, but nobody ever called him that. He was called Reds because of his hair color. Nobody except my wife and I in Miami knew this, and there was no place to look it up. He didn't even have an obituary when he died, and my daughter Amy was named after him just as she knew. My first child, a son, died when he was three weeks old of a very rare congenital heart disease called total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. What that is, the blood vessels from the lungs to the heart are coming in the wrong side of the heart. Mm -hmm. So functionally, as if it were turned around backwards. And he had died a decade before, 10 years before her therapy began. No place to look this up. It was He died in New York City. This therapy was taking place in Miami. Again, no obituary. Even our best friends didn't know these medical details. And I knew then. Because, as I mentioned, she's a laboratory technician, not a, an FBI agent. No place to look it up. She doesn't have money to look it up. I knew that this was something beyond the ordinary. And I remember my thought at that moment was, if she's right about these details about my father and my son, and she certainly was, could she be right about these other things, about past lives and reincarnation and life after death? Sure. And that, that was the moment probably that it really shifted for me and the rest has been kind of filling in the data and following up these validation cases and watching patients heal from their phobias and even physical healings as well so that that was the epiphany part that was when it happened for me in hypnotherapy uh dr wise how often does fantasy is fantasy a common player in these sessions or uh, is, uh, is it more likely to be a situation where the person has to tell the truth, or does it fall in between? It's in between. They don't have to tell the truth. They, they, they're not forced to. They can censor even under hypnosis and not tell you things. And fantasy sometimes comes out. That's the art of the therapist. But generally, there are things that aren't fantasy, like her telling me about my father and my son or the Chinese surgeon speaking English. Another case like that was of two boys around the age of three in New York City speaking a language to each other that seemed more than the rudimentary language that three-year-old 
boys would make up. They were twins. The father is a physician. And, and the boys were taken to Columbia University to the linguistics department where it was ascertained that the boys were speaking Aramaic to each other. Holy mackerel. Yeah, and this is virtually extinct. It's spoken in probably a few remote areas of Syria, but the boys had no exposure to this. The parents certainly had none. There's no cable channel that, that is in Aramaic in New York City. So All right. when these things start adding up like this, you have to understand that, yes, imagination can be there, fantasy can be there, so can metaphor and symbol, but sometimes the truth is there too. As a psychiatrist listens to a patient, how does a psychiatrist delineate between the truth, fantasy? I mean, you have to be able to do that for obvious uh, treatment reasons, I would think. Well, it helps. Sometimes it's hard to do that. You don't know. For example, I was seeing a woman um, who was under hypnosis and the regression therapy, remembering a, a, an ancient lifetime. She was in ancient Egypt. And she had uh, she died in that lifetime being buried alive. She was a servant in the burial chamber. Um, her master, a distant relative of the pharaoh, had died. And it was the custom in those ancient days to bury gold and belongings and servants even yes. with them so that they would be there when they woke up on the other side. I heard somewhere the other day that uh, the pharaohs themselves uh, were given some sort of... Um a drug to make the process easier for them and frequently or always the wives and uh, the lessers that would be buried with them would be given no such assistance and simply buried alive that's that's absolutely correct that's my understanding too and she died of suffocation in that burial chamber there are there are life. better ways to go that could not have been a good life, memory oh i know in this life she had severe claustrophobia she couldn't be in any enclosed space. Oh, I can imagine. And after that memory, it disappeared, the phobia. She could <sighs> travel in airplanes. She could be in elevators. She can be in small places without any anxiety at all. Now, we can't prove it. And you can't say, well, this is fantasy, this is imagination, metaphor, or an actual memory. But I suspect because her symptom disappeared when she remembered this ancient lifetime, that that one probably is not a fantasy. So one way of discerning would be to watch the improvement in symptoms. Huh. In other words, um, reality that was producing a painful side effect in this lifetime uh, would be like striking the mother load, and then the symptom would disappear. If it was fantasy being explored, then no effect. Right. That would be that would be one way of distinguishing between the two. Um. All right. I, for somebody with the, the level of experience that you have, I would like to explore a little bit, if it's possible, to, and understand something of the process. I think many out there would. The process itself. In other words, for example, when you die, is there an indication that you are immediately re reincarnated, or is there a period of time that passes, or is time an irrelevant word here? It, it probably is, is relevant and irrelevant. I don't mean to evade it, but because there's time here, but there may not be time on the other side. And it's just like modern physics is talking about. So what happens is that when we die, our consciousness seems not to die. That is, it, people are describing the same thing to me all the time. They leave the physical body. They float above the consciousness. They sometimes often look down upon the scene they have just left. They then become aware of, of a spiritual figure or a relative helping them. They become aware of a light that, that often energizes them, takes away any pain, any discomfort. And then there's often a life review when you go over your life. and How did you do? What did you learn? How did you treat people? And then the planning for the next life has is, is already begun. Really? And it may happen very, very quickly, or it may be more than a century. It depends upon the needs of the soul and who you want to come back with because there's a concept of soulmates or soul families that you may have been together with many of the loved ones in your life before in different bodies. <laughs> so so that's the process. And, and it's really quite amazing that no matter 
who the patient is that I'm working with. It can be a, a physicist, it could be a scientist, it could be a therapist, it could be a, a person with, with a high school education or a grammar school education, and they're still describing the same phenomena, the same process, that floating out of the body, that consciousness never stops, and that we go on and we come back here if we still have lessons to learn. You know, I have a lot of medical doctors, researchers, scientists on this program. Uh, and I would tell you right now that the majority of them, if you pin them to the wall, and I frequently do that, uh, don't believe in God. Don't believe in an afterlife. Believe that the process that you talked about with the light and all the rest of it is a simple manifestation, a physical manifestation uh, of the brain's dying process. And they just simply uh, think that uh, when they die, it's all over. Uh, the worms in and out, the blackness, and absolute nothingness. That is indeed what a very, very high percentage of doctors and scientists believe. Oh, I agree with you. And I was one of those, too. And I have the real advantage of, of these, all these years and thousands of cases of experience because they don't. And in general, what they're talking about is their opinion because they haven't really studied the phenomena. So if I had the chance to regress them, then they would start to know more. If they, you know, reading the books is one thing, but to actually have the experiences, and that, then they would start to understand more. Many who have had their own experiences were a near-death experience. Then they know more. So, you know, it's not just light that's caused by a chemical reaction when we die, because sometimes people in a near-death experience will go to the light, see the light, and, and they'll, they'll meet a, a spiritual figure or a relative, like Grandma, who then tells them that behind the doghouse, out in the backyard, that's where she hid the jewelry and the important papers. And then they go out and dig up back there, and that's and they find the box with the jewelry in it and the will, and that's not a chemical reaction. It's too specific. But again, I have the advantage of tracking these things down, of actually seeing thousands of cases, and they don't. This is their opinion, and I understand that. I was certainly one of those people before my experiences with Catherine all right. and all uh, the others. Hold it right there. We're, we're at the uh, top of the hour. Dr. Brian Weiss is my guest, a very credentialed man here talking about past lives and, incidentally, also future lives. We've yet to get to that. And uh, oh boy, would they hold a lot of action-packed information, I would think. Future lives. Future lives. Maybe that's time travel. Not in a capsule. I'm Artel. What we do lonely. No one waiting by your side. Uh, Dr. Weiss, um, I've got a fast blast here, one of these little communications I get, uh, thankfully, uh, from the Internet. During the program, people can send in little questions and stuff. And Sam in Socorro, New Mexico, says, Hey, Art, um, ask Dr. Weiss if he's heard about spirit comm tapes, and what does he think? Well, I bet you haven't, or maybe you have. I don't know. Halloween, I got hold of this incredible thing, uh, Doctor. It was... Um, taping that had occurred uh, during the years of work by a man named George Meeks. George Meeks um, created some electronic equipment using multiple tone frequencies to allow what he thought were the dead to, to speak in, in real time, to have real time communication. It appeared to demonstrate that, in fact, in fact, um, the uh, the subject who was uh, dead actually aided in the um, uh, the troubleshooting and the construction of some of the equipment used to improve the communication. I mean, this was one eerie thing to listen to. 
but this man appeared extremely serious, and his research seemed valid to me. He's now passed on, and I'm studying his research very carefully, trying to get to the bottom of it, but it would indicate, you know, if true, a conscious real-time communication with something that's passed from the physical and I guess that wouldn't surprise you would it no I think that's entirely possible and I remember reading about tape recordings yes and this kind of recording equipment picking up information picking up sometimes messages that's right and so it doesn't surprise me I think it we just it's a matter of developing the tools to record these impressions uh, well, perhaps at some point science and, and the metaphysical are going to have this great meeting. Oh, I think so. I think already the physicists are... are they are. ...the mystics of now. And when I read about string theory and M <laughs> theorems and parallel universes, it's really That's right. similar to what I'm writing about now. It certainly is. All right, we were talking about the process itself, this reincarnation process, and in trying to understand it, Here's one of the things that has always baffled me. As we grow older, I would like to think, um, though some things begin to fade, I guess, like vision and hearing and that sort of thing as the body erodes, we do acquire mental wisdom. And, um, you know, it's kind of like the school of hard knocks going through this life. And as you get older, you do acquire a certain wisdom just from having lived so long. Now, all of that would seem to go to waste if the nature of reincarnation uh, mostly includes not remembering, recalling, or experiencing in this life whatever happened in another life, only having it hit you subconsciously and, I don't know, causing you to have a smoking habit or some some other unsavory something. Sure, or fears or phobias or this kind of thing. Why, why doesn't all of that wisdom become inculcated in, into the... The reincarnating soul? I don't know. It's a very good question. I, I have two thoughts about it. One is that the, the amount of information would be so overwhelming if you, if you figure that you've lived hundreds of times or even thousands of times, how much um, paralysis would set in when you met someone that you may have interacted with in the 17th century. <laughs> you start remembering what they did to you and yes. how you felt and You'd never get anything done, especially with the people where you've had multiple lifetimes together. But I think the other reason, and I've asked this to my patients when they're in the deeper states, is why don't you remember? And the answer that comes back a lot is that this is a test. This is a school that we're in here, this earth. And we have to see, did we really learn the lessons? For example, are you nonviolent now? Um, because you know that spiritual beings, and this is who I think we really are, are a clue to our real nature that we're beyond just physical beings, but, okay, spiritual beings are inherently nonviolent, and not because you were punished because of a, a violent lifetime in the 12th century. So, so did you really learn the lesson? And so, in a way, this is a test, and I think the other reason, it would just be too, too much to carry around all of those details and facts, but more and more people are remembering now, whether it's through regressions or spontaneously or deja vu or through dreams or traveling in Europe and you're in a city and you know your way around and where the old church used to be but it, and the secret room in the church and yet it hasn't been there for the past 150 years. I think the consciousness is now expanding for whatever reasons and more and more people are remembering their past lives. Hmm. Um, if it's been a school and is a school for souls and... Um if those who are very spiritual are nonviolent, then one would think and hope that as time passed, the world would therefore become slowly but surely less violent. Now, I don't know. As I look around the world right now, I'm not sure that we have a graduating class on our hands here. I know, I know it looks that way, but I think we're over, we are becoming less violent. This is my own opinion, except that the technology is so much better today, so that now with news instantly giving us information about what's happening, happening in Afghanistan or Iraq yes, or yes. anywhere, 
we know about it within seconds, whereas 100 years ago or 200 years ago, we'd never know about it. Well, that's true. I think we're, we're less violent, but the technology is better. So we know so much more now. And a few bad people can do much more damage for the same reasons. How much damage could you do with a spear or a bow and arrow? And now you can do so much more. So I think we're evolving. I see so many good people and compassionate people. There are others, of course, but I think the technology throws us a curveball there, so it appears much worse than it is, because we know so much more now. I guess that's an acceptable explanation, just that uh, the media tells us, they do tell us a majority of bad stuff. I was noting that earlier. I mean, that's I just the nature, I guess, of, yeah. of the media. I don't know if it's all the news fit to print. Some good news could be fit to print. <laughs> Would it be helpful if you're... What you talk about or what's up on your website got into the newspapers because that's really the interesting news. And in the larger perspective, in the bigger picture, this may be the more important news. I'll say. Oh, I'll say. Uh, and, and, and in a moment, I want to get into future lives because there we may start to work together. I don't know. Um, but, but again, sticking with the process, uh, so many questions about it. For example, is there... In your work, is there any indication, uh, Doctor, that people tend to reincarnate in the same general geographic areas or the contrary? Is it like when you join the military? I mean, if you live on the East Coast, they ship you west and so forth. Well, it's a good question, too. I, I find that we, we tend to um, come around with a lot of the same people, the same souls. The relationships may change, so your grandmother may come back as your grandson or something like that but but geographically we are all over the place although i find most people in the western hemisphere have have remembering past lives from uh, the western hemisphere or europe and less so from the far east and when i was in japan they had more lifetimes in asia but there was a lot of taking of elective courses it was like in college you have a major sure you have to take elective so we've lived everywhere we seem to change race, religion, sex, because we have to learn from all sides. So we we may have a preference, and we may, all things being equal, be able to choose. But sometimes you have to take elective courses, too. By the way, there's another question that comes up all the time, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners are thinking about this one. How do the numbers fit if the population is larger than ever before on the planet? That was next on my list. It's a, it, it comes up... It's an important question. And if the population is so large now, where are the souls coming from? Yeah. And I, re I remember asking this to an attorney patient who spoke very differently when he was in the deep state. And I've asked this to many others. And he, I remember his answer very clearly. It was, how like humans to think of yourself as the only people and the only place? In other words, there are many dimensions and places where souls exist. And this is just one small school, one small place. Well, if that's true, if, if that is true, then occasionally during past life research, you should bump into the utterly unrecognizable. I, I mean, aliens. Sometimes that happens. That's what I was talking about with John Mack. That sometimes in, in my work... And I'm, I'm, one caveat, mostly I've been working with patients with symptoms, being a psychiatrist, and they tend to come more from lifetimes here. So I, I probably, I see many more lives on this planet, A, because they're more recent, B, because they tend to produce symptoms. But I have had people coming from other places, and there's one person in this new book, Same Soul, Many Bodies, uh, Patrick, who, in a regression was, you know, he, he was deeply under, went back to a lifetime 60,000 years ago on this planet and talked about his migration from a different planetary system or a different dimension. Oh, boy, this, this must get, it must get so interesting. It, I, it, I, it, you know, it gets wild. And, and I'm, I was thinking during the break that we have a couple of hours here, and it's fantastic and much better than doing television shows where they give me three minutes and say, oh, Doctor, tell me all about your work. I know. And we still will only scratch the surface of it. Yes, but to be sitting there and realize suddenly that you're getting 
something from somewhere else in the universe must be, oh, it must be in, just incredible. I, I, I mean, I guess you can't give us exact details from sessions, but what kinds of things were said to lead you to conclude that that's what you were suddenly hearing? Well, um, sometimes it's very specific. I mean, I remember Patrick, and he was saying that he was born on another planet. He, he said it had no name, because who knows how the thought processes are. Um, but he was part of a migration from his planet to Earth, because... And then he said, when we arrive, others greet us, descendants of beings from earlier migrations from different star systems. They're mixed among an evolving subspecies, human beings. Remember what he was saying. And then they had to stay here because their planet was dying. This one is new. And then he went into how they didn't have to actually come here. Um, they didn't have to physically come here. They could have, their souls could have been reincarnated into the humans around us hmm. or into other beings from other worlds, but they were a proud people, proud of their knowledge and their technology and their heritage. So they decided to come physically and bring all of their um, knowledge with them and then to store it. This was very interesting to me because I, I didn't know what I believed in. and It seemed almost like science fiction, but here he was in a deep state telling me all of these details and where they're now burying uh, their artifacts and written knowledge. And it was such a strange thing. It was in natural chambers deep under the Earth's surface. His thinking was, by the time humans have reached a level where they can understand uh, what they have hidden, they will be able to find it. And, wow. And then it went off into time and dimensions and all these other things. And then I thought, well, I think John Mack may have had it. But it's, it, it's, it's cer certainly a combination of our work. And then I was finding, with all of these stories too, and these we can't prove the same way we can, you know, with a right. Gina Glossy or finding your children, sure. more recent ones, sure. or reading a dog tag number from World War II, then we can certainly validate the cases but this is too far back that that souls may be the same wherever they are in any of the universes physically we may be very different but the souls may be the same so we can live in one dimension or one galaxy or what different universe and still reincarnate here because all souls seem to be the same no matter what universe they're from now the physical bodies differ tremendously but the souls don't Got you. So, that got very mystical. So a soul then would speak a universal language, understand uh, universally everything. Yes. But once, when you're in a physical body, we seem to be limited. So when we leave the body at the end of the life, as you were talking about in the first hour of the show tonight, that whole interface of life after death, it's really not death. I'm just using that as a shorthand because consciousness seems to go on. This is the same. And then I was finding, as I did work into the future, and this, writing about that in this book, that, that people um, going into future lives were kind of describing some of the same experiences as people who were leaving their bodies and going into higher dimensions. This, this is a, a definite break point. We're, we're ta starting to talk about future lives. Now, the whole... I mean, past lives... Even if I don't possess a proof you do, I can understand the whole concept of past lives because they've already happened. But now we're making a leap into future lives. Yikes. Right, but this is something I've been doing now for some years and even taking large groups of people into the future and then giving them questionnaires because just as you were talking about in the first hour with global warming, I wanted to see... What's this planet going to be like in 100 years or 500 years or 1,000 years? Is there going to be a consensus among these large groups of people that I'm hypnotizing and then progressing into specific dates in the future, filling out questionnaires and looking for a consensus? And I found it. Well, it was amazing. Uh, well, <laughs> obviously, um, I very much want to hear about this. Uh, do you have the kind of confidence in what you're going to talk about with respect to what you've learned about our future through, you know, future lives. Do you have as much confidence in it as you do in your past life work? Maybe a degree less because, as you said, it hasn't happened yet, although maybe it has happened, according to 
physicists and, and time, but we can't though validate it like with Jenny Kakel finding her children. And yet I'm getting about an 85% consensus on what the Earth will be like a thousand years from now. That's very heavy. Uh, that's very a, heavy. Oh, my goodness. Um, the Earth in a thousand years. Have you looked at various time scales, uh, beginning with a generation from now to what, whatever? A thousand years is a long time. Well, I didn't want to take them um, in groups into their current life because some people have anxiety about illness or death or this type of thing, of course. So I was taking them 100 years in the future, 500 years, and 1,000 years, those three dates. And I've done this now with about 5,000 people and given them questionnaires and had them um, describe their experiences and then even email me if they got too long. And... And it's just incredible. The consensus is most at 1,000 years, more than the others. All right, ho hold it right there. That, that's a, just a great place, frankly, to hold it. And uh, we'll find out what it's going to be like, what kind of world we're going to have in 1,000 years in a few minutes. You know what? I've been so blue. You know what? Remember you. Found someone new, and I wanna make my bright blue. I'll be back when you go. I just cry all night long. Say it is all true. Coast to Coast, and worldwide on the Internet, this is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Time after time. <laughs> That's really what we're talking about. A lot of people wondering what the world is going to be like. Well, you may be about to find out. Just before we dive into our own future, I guarantee you we're about to do that. Um, I would like to recommend to all of my listeners that you go to uh, Whitley Strieber's website, unknowncountry.com. And as you know, Ann Strieber uh, just had a, a stroke, a really serious stroke, about died. Really serious. And she had a near-death experience, a really interesting one. She met her beloved cat, Ko. And it's only, I don't know, a page and a half long. It's, it's called Anne's Diary, and she wrote about this. In fact, we're going to have her on the program, not this week, but uh, next week sometime. We're, we're going to have her on the program for at least an hour to tell you about this experience. She expected to meet uh, somebody else entirely, a family member. You can read about it. But she said, no, I met my cat, Ko. And she thought that perhaps it was because she so loved this cat. Her grandmother was uh, much weaker in her memory, um, and this cat, she had poured so much love, uh, shared so much love with this cat, that that's who she met. It's a fascinating story, and you might want to read it prior to tomorrow night's program. So you can do that on unknowncountry.com. It's called Anne's Diary. She's back, you know, and she's home. Anne is now home so i'm really looking really looking forward to that but uh just as sort of an offshoot and before we go into the future doctor is that within the, the realm of a near-death experience um you said there was so much commonality with the light and the relatives but instead of a relative she thought perhaps it was this incredibly strong love bond that made that happen Yes, that, that people have described that, and I haven't read it yet. I haven't read her account. But meeting the, an animal, especially a cat that was beloved by her, the, the energy there, the animals have souls too, it appears, because they're always meeting us on the other side. And the message there is about love. 
because that's what it's all about. That's seemingly the ultimate lesson. So she has a near-death experience, meets her cat, which is telling her that life goes on. The cat's soul is there, too. The cat is there, so people are there, same thing. And that the cat is greeting her because... That's the love connection. There. Is it stories like these that make you believe that animals have souls? Something that I've, uh, you know, I, I look at my animals. I have four cats. We love them. And you look into their eyes, watch their behavior, live with them 24 hours a day, and you do become convinced that they have, I mean, everything is there. Jealousy, love, hate, like, dislike. Uh, all these things, are, to some degree or another, can be observed in an animal, and other than consciousness of self, and we have no way of knowing about that one, all, every, all the other ingredients that we would attribute to a soul seem to be in these animals. Plus, they, they seem to be there in the near-death experience and the, and the after-death experience, and people report on these, people like Anne who come back, and so that that gives me the belief that animals have souls too and that they go on. Their consciousness also goes on. And, and then it gets even more complicated because all of our energies seem to be connected. You said their consciousness. Yes. Now, I guess a main contention would be that is the one difference between human beings and animals, that we have consciousness, awareness of self. They don't. Well, I was thinking of... Consciousness is almost a synonym for soul. That there, it's a, it's awareness. They, they may not have consciousness of themselves, but they have consciousness. They, okay. they see things. They react. They absolutely. And so, of course, they, they seem to, to have that characteristic. So, they go on too. And, and I don't know that much about animal souls, or whether we come back as animals. I don't find that in my research, but I know that's an Eastern concept. It could be. Perhaps we just don't remember lifetimes as animals because maybe there's no cross-species memory. I don't know. But, but it's certainly fascinating that so many people do describe meeting loved animals, pets usually. Well, they do the that. I, and, and you must be right about the other because uh, you haven't run in, and I've never heard of anybody else running into you know, a sudden memory um, of, I don't know, um, I don't know, having uh, fur, <laughs> you no, know, and no. leading an entirely different kind of life. No, and usually it's a metaphor when that happens. Um, for example, you, you might find yourself as a lion, and that means there's something requiring courage. Yes. But, but no, I, don't, I think that we just don't have these cross-species memories. It doesn't mean that we don't, it just means we don't remember. Uh, well, I don't know why, but I'm somewhat comforted by that. Not that I, I mean, I do love animals, but I'm not in a hurry to come back as a lizard or right. something. So that's just as well. Um, good. Okay, let's plunge into the future. Now, you obviously made a concerted effort once you realized it was possible to begin taking people into future lives and finding out what our world was going to be like. We're quite curious about that. I certainly am. Yes, and, and part of it, and when you were talking about Anne, the people who have had near-death experiences often come back with an ability to have precognitive dreams. That is, dreams of the future, and then these dreams seem to come true. So I had started studying that, and then progressing people into the future patients, and then I started progressing groups, and as I mentioned, giving them questionnaires and bringing them to specific dates. And I found that the date with the most consensus was the farthest date, 1,000 years in the future or more. Okay. And people were describing a very idyllic place here. No violence, no wars, no negative emotions, but a vastly, a very green, by the way, in some areas that were off limits for repair, which is interesting. Oh, really? But a vastly reduced population. Oh. And vastly reduced. And it seems that, that but people were happy. Now, People could come in and out of their bodies, too, just like people, again, having a near-death experience. They would have an out-of-body experience or conscious dying. That is, they could just leave their bodies at the time of death. By the way, the person, Patrick, that I described who came here 60,000 years ago could do that, too. So maybe it is in our future, but it's already been possibly done by other civilizations. At any rate, it seemed the next most consensus was, was that... There's much more detail in the book, by the way. 
I go into people describing desert museums because there were no are no more deserts on the earth in that year. And desert museums. Yeah, they they had to remember wow. what deserts are, so they had museums of deserts. Oh. So much more detail in the book, but I'm just that would imply, uh, I guess, man's control of the elements, huh? Yes, we had so we had progressed so much. And then the next most consensus was that the 100 to 200 years from now, where people were telling me basically that it was more of the same. There was um, more warming, more pollution, better science, better food technology, uh, farming in the oceans, um, wars, violence, but nothing cataclysmic. That's what I was looking at in terms of these prophecies and things that I've been reading about. It seems we're still there. And then... It's also important to remember that the future is a system of probabilities and possibilities, and our decisions will affect how we're going to get to that thousand-year mark because something happens in the middle. This was where there was the most oh, uh, confusion or least consensus that reduces the population. And, and we have some conscious input, apparently, into how that happens. The most benign way would be just a conscious decision not to have so many children. So you have but I, I, I'm afraid I'd lay money that that wouldn't be what happens. I would think we're not going in that direction, too. The next most benign way would be a decline in the fertility rate. By the way, that's already being measured. Uh, because of toxins or poisons or other factors, the, the, most, the least benign ways would be wars, um, meteors or asteroids or uh, viruses or illnesses, man-made things, catastrophes. And something in that middle period, four or five hundred years from now, that's where the population decline comes. But the Earth is still here. And and well, so nothing that you've received yet uh, has enough commonality among enough to for you to tell me what the age, what the agent of change is. No, and it may not even be in that sense completely decided yet we may be able to alter the future uh -huh. i go into that concept a lot in in this book how do you alter the future to make it better both your near future in this life and in your future lives and the future of the planet because we have our individual future lives but then the collective future of the planet and i think that our decisions in the near term are going to eventually determine how we get to that decline in population in that idyllic world a thousand years from now. Well, that implies, obviously, a lot of people on the short end of the stick, as it were. Um, but our souls are still okay, because they can never be harmed. So it could be that many of us are watching this from another dimension or from the other side. So our souls could end up elsewhere... In the universe, if instead of um, a need, a constant need for more souls that we have right now because we're increasing in population so much, there's a sudden um, n negative on the balance sheet. Well, those souls then go, presumably, it, it, well, well, what? Uh, would there be a period of time when simply reincarnation would not occur? Exactly. A longer period of time, let's say, um, or... Or we may be in other dimensions, higher dimensions. Some of us may have graduated by that time. No need to come back to this high school. Maybe we're in college then or graduate school. <laughs> so, so I think a lot of us won't have to be here. But the earth will be here and it will be replenished. And that to me was very positive because so many people were describing the same thing. And, and it's, again, it's a lesser level of confidence than I have with the past lives because there you can really go and validate. And yet, just the numbers are suggesting to me that that may be our intention and that may be you know, the, the probable future. And that middle period still worries me how we get there, but we're yeah. going to be okay. Well, um, you said the Earth's resources would be replenished. Right now, yeah. right now it seems as though we're realizing how finite these resources are. And, you know, peak oil is here, and we can see the, the other end of that situation energy-wise. And so I wonder how that replenishment occurs. Well, I, I think it's going to happen after that middle period. So what science is going to be like six, seven hundred years from now is, is so radically advanced from what it is now in terms of food production and 
and replenishing forests and uh, other and natural resources. I don't think we have to be concerned about that. It's going to happen. It's hard to even imagine. Um, it really is with with our current world and all the news we're getting. It just it seems as though we're headed for inevitable, and I guess we are. I guess we're headed for that inevitable middle period however it manifests itself. I think so, and we also have free will. We can accelerate that. <laughs> we, oh. can, we can bring it closer if we're really yes. bent on in going in that direction. Uh-huh. Well, I, I guess it's going to happen one way or the other, right? So I, I think so. I, I don't want this to sound like fact. This is just my research in giving in, with individuals and with, with several thousand people, progressing them in groups and giving them questionnaires, but just the sheer consensus is telling me that, that we're headed in that direction. Well, in a sense, when you take somebody to a future life, and I'm curious how you do that, but when you take somebody to a future life, gee, um, you're sort of traveling, in, you are time traveling. Yes. Yes. And, and it's so fascinating because it, the process is not so different from taking people into a past life. Remember you, you and I talking two years ago about this little book I had done with the CD in it that, that people can use and have a regression right in their home. It's yes. very safe. Oh, yes. It mirrors of time. And, the, and that CD doesn't take people into the future. It takes people into the past. But... Here's what I, see. Through... I, I, I Excuse me for interrupting. I, I, I do. I can sort of envision how you would take somebody into the past, you know, through their own conscious remembered life mem you know life memories uh this life and then sliding them earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier but right but i can't imagine the opposite process and and how you push somebody from this life into a future life do you just command it to happen in hypnosis or what it's it's there are many ways of doing it for example going into past lives you can do it through a symptom like when did you have this fear before or where did the symptom begin you could do it through an emotion. You can do it by putting people into a deeper state and then having them go through a door. The door may have a year on it. The year could be 1,800, 1,500. No kidding. It could be uh, 2,000 years ago. It, it can be a time machine and they press a button which has a year on it huh. and go back in time. And their, their subconscious mind will travel back in that way. So, so it dawned on me that if I just change the years on the door or in the, in the time machine, and now instead of taking people back to 1,500, I took them to 2,500 mm -hmm. or 3,000, yes. and it worked the same way. They would step out and they would be there. I'd have them look at their feet, describe their clothes, describe the environment, what's around, what's happening. And, and so the process is really the same thing, same what we call a bridge. That's going through the door or using a time machine or crossing a, uh, over a bridge or whatever. You can use the same techniques to take people into the future as in going back into the past. Doctor, whether it be the past or the future, how often in your research do you ever run, uh, do you run into religion? In other words, uh, do people speak of angels, devils, God, uh, that sort of thing, or is all of this seem to be separate from all of that? I, I think there are connections. People do talk about um, guides or masters or angels. I don't find hell. I don't find devils in this work. I think those were developed by men in order to control people. <laughs> but I do find the light. I do find the dimensions. I do find helping spiritual entities. Now, Patrick, remember the person that I talked about who came here yes. from before? And some others have told me that, that this gets very complicated because there could be that all lifetimes are simultaneous. <laughs> there, there is no time at one level. So they're all happening now in what could be called parallel universes. And what if, here's an interesting concept to me that's brought out by these patients that are described in this new book, what if, say, he, uh, an advanced entity dies, leaves a physical body, maybe he leaves it consciously because they've mastered that, and then goes to a higher dimension but can influence 
people still in their bodies in a positive way because this is a very learned being, learned person who died. Uh huh. We wouldn't we consider someone like that angelic? Well, we certainly we might. Well, yes. And it could be that angels are people from advanced earlier civilizations who have come here and are now and and incarnated for a while, graduated and are now helping us from the other side. In essence, it's all higher levels of consciousness. It's the same thing. So I am finding this. I find God all the time, but more not as an old man sitting on a cloud, but more as a as an incredible and almost undefinable, wise, intelligent energy that's in every atom of our being. I find that description very commonly with lots of higher levels of consciousness on the way to God and indescribable characteristics on the way to God. So I find that I just don't find all the negative stuff, not devils, not hell, because I think those are inventions of man. May well be. Certainly man has had his hand in the rewriting of not just even fairly recent history, but uh, history going back to the time when the religion many of us believe in began. How much of it, I wonder, was rewritten? My guest is Dr. Brian Weiss, and we're talking about past lives. When we get back, we'll launch to phone calls. We'll also find out about his books, where you can get them, and where you can read about more of this sort of thing, if you so desire. And if you're still with us at this point, I bet you do so desire. I'm Art Bell. Seven seven five seven two seven twelve ninety five. The first time caller line is area code seven seven five seven two seven twelve twenty two. To talk with Art Bell from east of the Rockies, call toll free eight hundred eight two five five zero three three. From west of the Rockies, call eight hundred six one eight eight two five five. International callers may reach Art by calling your in country Sprint Access number, pressing option five, and dialing toll free eight hundred eight nine three zero nine zero three. We're talking about the ride that we're all on, and maybe go on again and again and again. My guest is uh, Dr. Brian Weiss, and uh, he's indeed a heavyweight to be talking about this topic. Graduate of Columbia, Yale, Yale Medical School. Uh, Dr. Weiss is Chairman Emeritus of Psychiatry at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami, maintains a private practice in Miami as well. He knows of what he speaks. Well, all right, Dr. Weiss, Rob uh, Fast Blast Me from Diamond, Illinois, uh, the following. Wow! That was the first description of something called God that makes sense to me. I'm, I'm wondering, and I have always wondered, if there's such a thing as getting off the reincarnation wheel, or, like it or not, are we stuck doing this until we get it right? Is that really the 
I, I guess, is that the answer you'd give? That uh, you are stuck with it and you could fail the fourth grade a hundred times and you'd still have to keep going until you made, made it through. Right, but eventually you're going to make it through. And that's the key to it. We're, we're all going to graduate. And there are other schools, other dimensions. So it's really not so onerous. It just means you get more than one chance to get it right. And then you graduate. You move on to the higher levels of consciousness, to the higher dimensions. Have you had any indication uh, in your research, uh, or would you not, of somebody who has made graduation? You, normally I'm seeing patients, so they didn't graduate. But they, they tell me, because sometimes, and I've studied mediums and people like that. I've studied consciousness. I want to know how people have these abilities. But in working with my patients, I find they're telling me that. Yeah, the people have graduated. And I guess like in, in, then they don't have to come back here, but they're helping us out from the other side. Because at a deeper level, we're really all connected. There's, there's this connecting energy. We're not so separate as we seem. So in, in the final analysis, we don't really graduate until everybody graduates. But there are others who are on the other side helping us out now. And, and that makes sense. That makes sense. We're, I guess the Christian mystic Teilhard de Chardin put it the best way for me. He said, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. <laughs> so that's, that's us. We good. come, we have a human experience. Yeah, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, your, your books, uh, what is your current book? The current book, the one that goes and talks about the future, is called Same Soul, Many Bodies. And that is out how long now? It came out in November. In November? Oh, it's a baby. It's a baby. It's one month. Um, and I would presume Amazon... Dot com is one source, and, and is it on bookshelves around? What's yes, the deal? It's, it's in bookstores. It's certainly in Amazon and online, and, and it's easy to get that way. But it's, it's published by the Free Press, Simon & Schuster, so it's in all the bookstores also. And, and that book, the title, Same Soul, Many Bodies, comes from a quote from Plotinus, the Roman philosopher, because it has a double meaning to me. The, the meaning, of course, in past lives and future lives is that it's the same soul, our soul, going into many bodies, coming back again and again. Is, is there any way to understand if the number of souls is finite, or are there new souls I being think there created? Are new you, you think, oh, I'm sorry, you, you do think there are new ones? Yeah, that's, that's the numbers thing again. The, the, the number of bodies keeps expanding here as the population increases. So souls are coming here from other dimensions, from other schools, however you want to describe it. And, and yet there's another mechanism, too, that's come up from time to time, and that's the concept of soul splitting and having more than one, being in more than one body at the same time. And that's the other meaning of Plotinus's quote. Maybe there's just one soul, same soul, many bodies, that's, that's energizing all of our bodies and that we're really connected and there's one kind of master consciousness and and to me it both exists that we're individuated we're, we're we feel ourselves as individuals and yet there's something that connects all of us also so just like i'm talking to you now i'm sitting in a chair yes and i know this chair is solid it's supporting my weight but i also know that it's made up of atoms and subatomic particles and quarks and and electrons and so it's all energy also and yet it's solid and I think we're like that we're separate and yet we're all connected and that's one of the great mysteries of our existence here so many things we just flat don't understand yet huh exactly and yet there probably are advanced civilizations where they're further along this this path it's we're just one place and I keep thinking about that attorney's quote how like humans to think of yourselves as the only people and the only place. Hmm. We're not alone here. Uh, how's your book been received? Uh, I, I, a lot of, a lot of people like yourself will send out advanced copies to um, other professionals to have a read and comment on before they go to the big publish. Do you do yeah. that? 
Yes, the the book has been received pretty well. The future is is more it's, it's harder for people to grasp. The case histories in this book, I think, are very good, and so it's at a clinical level, it's been received very well. Many lives, many masters. The first book that's now in thirty five languages. It's all over the world. It's been uh, huge in China and Japan and this country, all over Latin America. So there's already that audience for it. And, and so it's kind of the next step here. Sure. I, I would think that audience wouldn't have that difficult a time uh, making the transition to the understanding that time is perhaps not the way we think of it in, in that linear way we all look at it, but very different indeed. Right. And, and it's also, again, it's, it's more case histories and helping these people going into the past and, of course, also into the future. But it's still getting back to why we're here, what are our lessons, how do you get rid of these symptoms? How do you make better decisions in the future? And, and how, ultimately, how do you heal yourself? How do you get rid of your symptoms and feel more joy or more happiness or better relationships in your life now? So that's really um, a big part of this book, too. I'm always thinking as a psychiatrist and clinically, is how is this going to help people? How is it going to help them to understand more and through that understanding to feel better? And I think... And that's the feedback I'm getting, that it's, again, in this series, it's the eighth book, actually. So it's, it's still it's kind of my work. Every couple of years, I write another one yes. because I've accumulated more patients and more stories. Dr. Weiss, as this science uh, progresses, do you think that it might be possible to begin to refine the techniques used and get down to even more specific information about the future uh, even the more immediate future, the next 10, 20, 30 years, and begin, in other words, to go the next step in the research? Absolutely, yes. I mean, there's no reason we can't do this now. Uh, going back into the past, I've called it sometimes regression archaeology. <laughs> yes. Instead of digging, you can just go back and remember. Yes. And And going into the future should be the same way. We can take people. I've been doing it with individuals taking them into the future, helping them to make better decisions now, going um, five years, ten years, whatever. I've been reluctant to do that with groups because, I, as I mentioned, I don't want people to get nervous. <laughs> and if they think, well, you know, maybe I'll find out I have an illness or I died or a loved one died or a pet died, I'm going to be upset. So I've been very careful in doing that with my patients individually. Yes, but not in groups. In groups, I've been going minimum 100 years ahead. But certainly with individuals, one could. And if if you had a group of people that said, look, I'm okay with it. I understand that the future is a system of probabilities and possibilities, and whatever I find, I'm fine with that. That would be a group you could really do this research with. So, so you've limited yourself to 100 years and out for, group. Sa for safety reasons. Right, right. For That's group. understandable. But I'm taking individuals when they're in my office. And if they say it's okay, then we're going into their future of this life. Is what you find always known to the patient? Or if not, then do you at the end of the session... Uh, uh, well, for example, let me try it this way. Uh, if dur uh, During a session, if, if you've run into something really, really traumatic for the person... Um, are there occasions where you decide it is safer for that person to instruct them not to have conscious memory of what you just heard them live through? That comes up rarely. Usually um, the, their subconscious wisdom is very protective. Certainly in going back into the past, and this has already happened, if, if they remember something that is traumatic, I'll have them float above and just watch it from a distance, detaching from it, because the lesson is very valuable. Eventually they realize that they can go back to it again and again and again, and the, the emotion lessens each time, and then they can remember it, and the symptom, which is already there, it will disappear or get better. Going into the future, this is still very new. Oh, yes. When the book's been out a month. People in general are not doing this, so I think it's a tremendous area of potential research. And certainly, it's helping people make decisions now. For example, if a person has an important decision coming up in their life, I can put them into these deep states 
and the, the new book describes how to do this, they sometimes, and then take them to the fork in the road where the decision is. Right. Should they move to Pittsburgh or move to Los Angeles or take this job or marry this person or whatever, and, and just visualize it as a fork in the road. Maybe there are two paths or three. And just doing that, one of them often lights up, widens. It's inviting you, and the others shrivel and become very dark, and you're getting an answer there. So it helps you make your decision. Absolutely. Life is nothing but a whole series of forks in the road, as you and, point and out. That's, and that's changing the future when you make these decisions. Because if we talk to physicists, for example, they're knowing that in one, one subset of string theory is that every time you make one of these important decisions, you're creating a new universe or a parallel universe. For example, a listener tonight deciding to tune in and hear the show is, is, is creating this universe where now they have the experience and the knowledge and the wisdom and whatever of hearing the show tonight. But if, if they had decided not to hear it, they said, well, I'm tired, I'm going to sleep tonight or do something else, they're off in a parallel universe doing something else. Who knows? Hmm. We are. Uh, so the, the two are getting closer and closer. Closer Let's, and closer, exactly right. Go to the phones. Wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Weiss. Hello. Hello, this is Steve from Honolulu. Hi, Steve. Hey, how you doing, Art? Long-time um, fan, long-time fan. But it's a real privilege to uh, ask Dr. Weiss a couple questions. Um, Dr. Weiss, I'm a clinical psychology student here in Honolulu, and I'm wondering, uh, my first question is this. Do you do any training with students, or do you do any training with therapists in your techniques and the second question is I've done some work in my master's degree with um, um, adolescents who are struggling with schizophrenia and I'm wondering what the relationship is between past life regression and schizophrenia where this is sort of bleeding into their current frame of reference and that compartmentalized and I'll listen offline but thank you for taking my call all right schizophrenia uh... sure. um, first the first question was about trainings of professionals and I do two of those a year and that he can find all the information on my website. It's already up there. It's brianweiss.com, and he can find it through your website. Okay. Um, the show. And and the second part is with schizophrenia. We haven't been working as much with schizophrenics because the technique, hypnosis, requires concentration. This research is just beginning now also. We found many uh, people misdiagnosed. They were having clairvoyant experiences or, or actually clairaudient experiences, hearing voices, but they weren't schizophrenic. So we found that oftentimes um, this is different from a past life, though. Past life and schizophrenia don't find that so much, but I find that when we choose our parents, that you inherit the biological line of the parent, the parents, the genetic line. The evolution of the soul is a different line. So you may have been with them before, but once you decide to come back, then if there's a tendency towards schizophrenia or diabetes or hypertension or anything else, that's what you're going to have. But still, research with schizophrenics is new. We've been doing this mostly with uh, phobias, anxiety, depression, and psychosomatic disorders and physical disorders. All right. Uh, circling back to the other question about training, how many of those... But what's the feedback been from those that you have trained? Uh, what have they gone on to do? Well, many of them go on to do this work, to, to, to introduce techniques of past life regression. It hasn't been progression yet. I've only done one training of that. Um, but using these techniques, they then incorporate it into their practices. And you don't have to be a therapist to come to these. We don't restrict it to therapists anymore because... That almost drove me crazy just to break through the closed mind, the, not the closed mindedness, but the rigidity. So now we have about two thirds therapists and one third people who just want lots of experiences coming to these trainings. Oh, fair enough. Uh, that's a big piece of information for a lot of people out there. Um, oh, for sure. And then, and they get experiences because then for five days, they're just having these regression experiences and now progression experiences. But the therapist will feel comfortable enough to take it back into their practices. And, by, and then I kind of supervise from a distance, and they're telling me about their results with patients. And it's been marvelous because I've trained about 2,000 therapists over the last 
15 years since I started doing the training. So they see a dramatic increase in the success rate they're having? Yes, yes. And, and it's also increasing the N, you know, the number of people having regression experiences. So I'm, this is providing more validation and more safety because now we have lots of people who have undergone regression experiences. And I'm finding that it's not me. It's nothing magical with me. I just, I'm a psychiatrist and I've been doing this work, but I can train others to do this work too. And it changes their lives. They're, they're now able to help their patients in a different way. And they're going to observe, just like I have, people speaking foreign languages, people validating past life experiences, people um, talking about life after death and consciousness existing after the death of the physical body and soulmates and reunions with loved ones. And that's going to change the therapist's life as well as the patient. I would think, for me, for example, so, you know, hearing somebody suddenly speak a foreign tongue, fluently, obviously fluently, that would probably do the trick for me. I mean, I'd then be inclined to do some research and see if there was any way that person had learned the language. And if not, that's pretty good stuff, doctor. That's very good stuff, Art. And that's, that's, you know, that's very dramatic when it happens. That does not happen so often. But it, when it does happen, it's very dramatic. And, you know, when someone finds their grave, that's dramatic. Or someone finds their children from a past life, that's dramatic. So... So eventually you're going to see one of these dramatic cases and that's going to force you as a scientist, which we, you know, if you think about what is science, and that's keeping an open mind, not having your mind already made up before you study something, and then testing it, that's developing the hypothesis, and then having others test it, and then it becomes a theory that science is really keeping the open mind. Well, doctor, if it was such a good thing, to know about our past, past lives, or and or our future lives, then why wouldn't it be part of the natural process? Well, I gets back to that that thing about this being a test, a school. Do we really learn our lessons? And and yet something's happening now because more and more people are remembering their past lives. It's not just these couple of thousand people that I've trained. Others are doing it. Uh, some are more qualified. Some are not so qualified, but it's really catching on as a technique. So now, tens of thousands of patients, more, have experienced past lives. And I, I think it must be because there's a need for it. Or... Okay, well, uh, hold on. We're at, the, we're, we're at the bottom of the hour. Dr. Brian Weiss is my guest. I'm Art Bell. Past and future lives what we're talking about. This is the man who's done the research with very heavy credentials. If you have questions, that's why we're here. Seven seven five seven two seven twelve ninety five. The first time caller line is area code seven seven five seven two seven twelve twenty two. 
To talk with Art Bell from east of the Rockies, call toll-free at 800-825-5033. From west of the Rockies, call Art at 800-618-8255. International callers may reach Art Bell by calling your in-country Sprint Access number, pressing Option 5, and dialing toll-free 800-893-0903. From coast to coast and worldwide on the Internet, this is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Boy, there is so much intuitive wisdom in much of the music. Have you noticed? You actually sit down and listen to the words. There is just a great deal of intuitive wisdom. The kind of wisdom that you wouldn't think uh, would come to young musicians like this. But it did, didn't it? Dr. Brian Weiss is my guest, and he'll be right back with you. I mean, if we were supposed to know about the past or the future, then, as I said, I wonder why it wouldn't be part of the natural process. But I, I, it may be a slowly occurring evolution, Dr. Wise saying that more and more people are becoming conscious, for example, of their past lives. Michael in Memphis, Tennessee, fast blast the following. What about the condition of the U.S. 100 years from now? Tell us about any significant difference in, for example, our government structure or economic status with respect to the rest of the world. Now, um, my expectation is that you probably cannot answer such a detailed question, but that, that's why I asked you if the, if the science continues to progress, eventually, I guess, we would get that kind of detailed information. That's your ex expectation, right, Doctor? Absolutely. We could ask those questions now. Uh -huh. In progressing groups of people into the future, we can ask them specifically about government, about culture. One, one thing that I've noticed is boundaries changing, uh, not so much in the U.S., but it's certainly in the Middle East and other places people have talked about that. In the U.S., um, people have been describing more um, the scientific changes and, and also more of the global warming, um, more pollution, but better science, better food production, starting to use the oceans more. Um, industries, this is more 200 years from now, moving off the surface of the planet so that they don't pollute so much, and now they're taking place in space. But I didn't get into government structure as much as we were more concerned with the, the nature of life and, and science and food and things like that. So I, I haven't asked those questions yet. That would be a fascinating thing to do. It sure would. All right. Wildcard Line, you're on the air with Dr. Weiss. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Yes. Weiss. How good are morning. you? Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, and it kind of has to do with me, but um, uh, have you ever had the phenomena of somebody looping through and having knowing of, like, the future from six months to maybe, like, you'll get in an accident or you'll know what's going to happen, and they loop through, and they like they've been through this whole process once? I I've had people having precognitive dreams and precognitive flashes where they see things or know things that are going to happen in the future six months, a year. Often their accents or things like that. It's kind of an early warning system or early de de detection. It doesn't cause it. But I'm not sure what you mean by looping Well, through. by looping is by going through my whole life more than one time, this, this, like talking to you right now or watching the TV or... You know, things like that. Like, I've been, in, uh, I've had a couple of inventions. I've been, like, the DLP lighting system and TV screens, and also the three screens in churches. I, I, I started all that stuff years ago. And, um, uh, I just have the, these intuitions, but I also have this real strong feeling that I, I've been through this whole thing more than once, exactly as it is. Yes, I've had people describe that too. Actually, that's a kind of looking into the future or awareness of the future. And some people talk about it even before their lives begin, that they look over their life, the significant events, the features of it, the significant people that they'll meet in their life, so that when they do meet them or have these experiences or come to that destiny point, it seems very familiar. And that expression, deja vu, as if you've seen it before, that's what that means. Well, earlier I heard you use the phrase several times, um, our choice. As though at every juncture, with respect to choosing our parents, uh, in other words, do we have choices 
as we do in this life, we have constant, we talked about that, constant choices. And what you've implied is that we have constant choices on the other side of the physical existence as well. Yes, it appears we, we learn through these choices, through free will. There are certain things that are destiny. That is, if you're supposed to meet a certain person that's going to influence your life in a significant manner, you will meet that person. That's destiny. But how you react after that, whether you um, reject the person, accept the person, get married, do this, do that, that's all the free will, your reactions to mm. the event. So we, we're always learning through these choices, moving more or less away from our, our spiritual path, our destiny path, whatever you want to call it. But I, I think that's critical that we exercise our free will here. That's how we learn. Exactly. Um, East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Brian Weiss. Hello. Yes, hi. This is uh, Usha from Rockville, Maryland. How are you? Thank you for taking my call. You're very welcome. I'm, I'm a little nervous, so I hope I get my question um, correctly out. And it's an honor to be on uh, with you and with Dr. Weiss. I've read all his books. I've just ordered some tapes of his, except the new one. I haven't read the new one. But I want to know, I lost my 19-year-old son very recently, and I, I wanted to, you know, I'm trying to believe that he's reincarnated and will be with me again. On the other hand, I, I hear about psychic mediums who connect up with souls, you know, who are past. And I'm confused, um, you know, whether there's reincarnation or, or how do they connect up with the souls if they're reincarnated? Right. I, that's a good question. It, it sure is. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important, I think, to know that, and I've studied these mediums, that's what I... I was talking about earlier, I wanted to know how could they do this? How does consciousness work? And it seems that the time to reincarnate varies tremendously. It may be very brief, very short, or it may be longer than a century or even longer depending on the needs of the soul and the people with whom they will come back. For example, your son. We know that he's still there. He's still around. You may be getting signs. Even if he does reincarnate, you can still communicate with him on the other side because the part of our soul or spirit that's in the body is only the tiniest fraction. We're much, much greater than the physical body. So whether he's reincarnated or not, they can still communicate with him on the other side. This is like a higher mind. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one to get your mind around. It you're, really you're, you're, in other words, you're reincarnated, mm -hmm. but you're also part of the whole still part of the bigger picture and you can be communicated with exactly you really it's possible to tap into all consciousness i think this is what carl jung the psychoanalyst meant by the collective unconscious even though you're in a physical body you can tap into all wisdom and all knowledge and you can communicate with the other side it's a complicated concept but it just means that we're much greater than the physical body we're far greater than our brains dr weiss are you um keeping yourself familiar with the consciousness work being done at princeton a little bit yes uh, it's quite remarkable yes yeah some of that work is is tremendous and it would seem to validate some of what you're saying yes Yes, it, re it really, it's amazing to me when I read about this in consciousness studies or in modern physics, um, how similar it really is. <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Weiss. Hi. Hi, yes. I have a, a comment and a question. Okay. He was talking about uh, a case he had where a woman was had this fear of gagging, and in her past life, uh, it, it it was uh, sort of discovered that she had had a drowning experience or possibly a drowning experience, something with water. And though that sounds sort of a logical thing. And I was wondering if he um, could comment on something um, like chronic depression or um, I call it the soul escaping. It's just sort of you, you get detached from life. And I've been suffering from this for 10 years now. And I'm just wondering if that... You know, if he has had cases that have to do uh, with this kind of symptom and what kind of things he's discovered um, in looking into their past lives. Okay. It's, yes, it's not necessarily as connected as drowning and fear of water or gagging or dying in a fire of, say, 
smoke inhalation, asphyxiation, and asthma, those things are closely connected and often get better when the past life is recalled. But depression, there's so many different types. Sometimes it does carry over from past lives. Sometimes it's from this life, childhood or adolescent. Sometimes there are biological inputs. And sometimes all of this is mixed together. And you don't know until you do the regression how much you're going to be helped. Sometimes it's just the fear of death and dying or grief. And that has helped tremendously when a person has a past life regression. All right. Let me try this out on you. I, I don't know if I should or shouldn't, but I'm going to. Okay. I interview a, a man called Matthew Alper, and you can stop me and say, you know, I've heard that show with Matthew, um, if you wish. Uh, Matthew Alper is a fascinating man who wrote a, a book called The God Part of the Brain. He was on the, on the show, in fact, last week. It it says that the the fear of death that you just spoke about is so strong that it, through the process of evolution, has caused our brains evolving to to, to create a part of the brain that demands human beings worship. And he says it's a protective mechanism the brain has developed uh, to deal with the fear of mortality. What do you think of that idea? It's very interesting, and I, you know, I, I, I saw that on your uh, website, and I read, I went on his website, and I heard part of it. It's, it's fascinating. I think it's more, though. I, I think it's more than just a protective thing. He talks about God being hardwired in. That's right. Religion, that's right. hardwired into the brain. And I think there's more to it. Just, just from this work with past lives and regression and consciousness existing outside of the body. When I was in my psychoanalytic training, I, I remember coming across the Freudian concept that God and gods and, uh, are really the equivalent of our parents or significant adults standing over the side of our crib while we're so powerless and they seem so omnipotent. Uh-huh. It's not that either. It seems to me more than that, more than just a protective hardwiring device because... I have so many people who are non-believers, and then they have these experiences, these mystical experiences or spiritual experiences, completely changes their life. And it's not a gradual thing. It's just a sudden thing. It's like an awakening. It's interesting. I, I asked Matthew about the possibility of his having such an experience, and his only reaction was, my God, I'd have to recall and tear up all my books. Yeah. <laughs> and, and one good, solid regression can do that. <laughs> um, Hi there, you're on the air with Dr. Brian Weiss. Where are you, please? Hi, I'm in Roanoke, Virginia. Roanoke, Virginia. I can barely hear you, sir, so you're going to have to yell at us. Okay. Um, my question is, does, doctor, does the doctor have more of a sense that children that were born C-sections have more of a retention of past life memories? Ha uh-huh. ha. Um, all right. Uh, th- those who have not come through the normal birth process, doctor, but rather have been C-sectioned. I have not <laughs> studied that at all. I don't uh, think right. anybody has, you know, because then you'd have to go back and in your history with the patient, you'd be asking specifically, were you born by C-section or not? I don't know that anyone has ever done that kind of statistical correlation well how about this question then doctor um when you have a subject under hypnosis um are they with do you think that they are without error able to remember things about for example their their own birth uh, how traumatic it was or wasn't it would be a major moment for a soul to be sure so do you find people able to remember that incredible moment or even even prior to that Absolutely. We've had many validated cases of people with in utero and birth memories, validated by their parents or others, describing the hospital setting, describing the situation. Um, it's, it's amazing. The memories are there, and, and many people do remember their birth. I haven't found, though, a difference between a, a normal birth and a C-section birth. Got that. But they, they take they them through their that. Birth. No pro- wow. First time caller line, uh, you're on the air with Dr. Brian Weiss. Hello. Uh, hi, Dr. Weiss. Hi, hi. Art. Um, my name is Karina. I'm calling from Woodland Hills, California. Okay. 
And I just had a question on dreaming in different languages where you speak uh, different languages fluently and you're also reading a book fluently. Wow. Was that coincidence? Could that be coincidence or would that be any indication of um, prior lives? It could be. I'm not saying that it definitely is, but it could be a prior life. When people are actually speaking it, then I'm having, you know, a significant other, someone maybe sleeping in the same room, tape it. Because mm -hmm. that's the best thing to do. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. That's amazing, though, nevertheless. I mean, oh, it is. To, to read, uh, to speak and read in another language when you're dreaming, I've never heard of that. Uh, yeah, and it surprises me every time I wake up from that sort of a dream. And sometimes I remember the specific language and sometimes I don't. But I wish that when I wake up, I could remember what I was reading and, and actually write it down or speak it. But there's no way. It's like it's completely erased. Do you know what may help is just to keep a tape recorder right by the side of your bed or a notepad. Okay. And as soon as you wake up, even before you move, mm -hmm. even before you move, start going over the dream in your mind. And then before you go to the bathroom or anything, just mm -hmm. dictate it into the tape recorder or... Write down, you know, what happened, what you can remember, and you'll train yourself to remember more because you can go back and have the dream again and again. Boy, you sure are right about that. And if you yeah. don't, if you don't make those notes, if you don't tap that memory right now, it's gone. Why is that, Doctor? <laughs> That's just how our brains work. That kind of memory is very fleeting. But I find that the more people go over it in their mind, like, and put a title to it, like German Castle or something, or Huh. And put a title to it, um, go over it in your mind, and then dictate it right away before you eat, before you go to the bathroom, before anything. Dictate it or write it down, and that will train your mind to remember it longer also, by the way. Okay, thank you. Good, Good luck. luck. Thanks. Right, uh, that's pretty odd. Speaking and reading in a foreign language, I've never had such a dream, and then, or that I recall. And then... Uh, and I, and I think I would remember that. And then really? and having it hit you in the morning that you actually don't remember any of that, but you do remember having total understanding of that language as you do your own native language right now. I think she may be getting a message, and if she practices that writing it down or dictating it, she's going to remember more and more of it. <laughs> uh, perhaps very quickly, wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Weiss. Hello. Yes, uh, this is going to freak you out. Lately, in the last six months, I've been talking to people that are that haven't gone into their past life yet, that haven't died, but I've been talking to them in their past life, and they have yet to die yet, and that that has freaked me out. It's been happening in the last six months. It has happened recently with a good friend of mine whose father passed away, but I have spoken to him. Uh, spiritually, in his past life, but yet he had, he hadn't passed away. Got it. Uh, it's uh, oh, oh. almost making me worried that I'm I'm almost about to meet my own mortality because <laughs> I, I'm talking to people in their past, in, in their afterlife already, but they haven't died yet. I I'm no, I understand, uh, Doctor. Very quickly, because we're short on time. Uh, that is the key word, time, isn't it? Uh, it's it's all sort of run together. So what this man is saying could be. It could be. It doesn't have anything to do with his own mortality. He should relax. It's just <laughs> his psychic ability coming out, and he's communicating at deeper levels with with this, uh, the consciousness, the spiritual nature, more than just the person, more than the physical person. He shouldn't worry. So, the soul, uh, no matter what state it's in, past, present, or future, and he just happens to be connecting with the present, Right, and, and, you know, on the show now, people are, are getting permission to call, no matter how strange it may seem, and talk about their experiences. And this is fabulous, because so many of us have had these experiences. If we just open our minds to it, we're going the to The only more. thing that will get them talking about it is a show like this. Uh, you're the right only that. place that does it. Dr. Weiss, we're done. We're out of time. Thank you, my friend. Have a great night. Good luck with your book. Thank you, Art. Good night. Good night. Dr. Brian Weiss, well... What do you think? Do we come into this life again and again and again? From the high desert, see you tomorrow night.
wide desert in the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whatever the case may be in the time zone in which you reside. Every single one of them covered.